Test, test, one, two. And hi, everybody. Uh, watching at now both netfoods.tv and uh, uh, Inside Foods TV at YouTube. And if you are at netfoods.tv, you can head over there and check it out as well if you'd like to. Uh, and subscribe to the Inside Foods TV channel at YouTube if you wish. Well, I'm going to get my, my pipes ready here for three hours of, uh, of me sitting here talking foosball, not only about the matches, but also with a, a few interviews that we have lined up. I've got a couple of good trivia questions with Inside Foods videos as prizes. And we're looking forward to a concentrated three-hour TV show, if you will. We're at Inside Foods TV and NetFoods.tv from the Washington State Open here in beautiful Seattle, Washington. We're going to open things up here in just a few minutes uh, at 5 o'clock Pacific time, which is in about three and a half minutes, with a mixed doubles match here on table number one. And we're going to keep the content coming. We have uh, cameras set up on both tables one and table two. And... Um, we are looking forward to uh, a great three hours of action here from the Pacific Northwest. So hang in there, and we're going to be live with you here in just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, Foosball Clubs USA has been reaching out to schools and youth centers since 2015, introducing a whole new generation of youth to the uh, great sport of foosball. Visit their site at foosballclubsusa.com for information on how you can get involved. You know Foosball Clubs USA needs motivated individuals to help with their state and national programs, in addition to players who work locally. Some of the skill sets that are needed uh, by this important organization, our public relations, web development, fundraising from local and national businesses. Contact John O'Brien uh, to discuss your interest in helping, and you can reach him, of course, at uh, foosballclubsusa at gmail.com. And if you get a chance at a tournament, also stop by the Foosball Clubs USA booth and visit with John. That'd be great as well. And you can check everything out over, of course, at foosballclubsusa.com. Let's get the kids involved, folks. It's up to all of us as foosball players and promoters and contributors to make sure that uh, the next generation is healthy in the sport of table soccer. Getting ready for a mixed doubles match over here on table number one. We've got a few interviews lined up as well that we're going to squeeze in between matches and also, of course, uh, uh, during matches a little bit as well. And there comes Justin Shaw, who is going to be a participant in this match upcoming. got some mixed doubles action for you. We are on table number one. In a match for fourth place or better in the loser's bracket. That's Alan Turner over there on the right side with his partner Michelle Neal. And on the left, Justin Shaw and Laura Constante. Best two games out of three. The winner would stay alive. The loser would finish fifth. Thank you. 
So we're opening up our uh, our three hours of uh, concentrated foosball with a little light adjustment. And I think we're uh, about ready to go here in this mixed doubles match. Been a great weekend of table soccer here, thanks to Mr. George Barta and, of course, uh, Mike Donaldson, who uh, may be joining us. Both of those guys may sit in with us for a little while as we are beginning uh, a marathon, uh, so to speak, although certainly we, we do commentate uh, pretty long hours at, at most events. But for this one, it's three consecutive hours without break as we get uh, game number one underway here in this mixed doubles match. Underway here in game number one, Alan Turner will put it into play. And Alan, of course, one of the, the Foos brothers. He's Elwood, Rich Fosner would be Jake. Had a chance earlier on uh, Facebook Live as Alan looking to set up a pull kick and stroke it home. It's one nothing. Got a chance earlier to talk to Alan, who is an assistant principal at a school, and he has a program of 48 school kids playing on nearly an everyday basis with tournaments, with after school play, uh, play at lunch. Doing a great job up there. Look at that smooth left hook from Justin Shaw to make it 1 1. Laura Constante moving into the forward position. Shaw back at goal. Alan Turner, one for two, shooting it so far. Justin Shaw, a very good shooter from goal. As goalie war titles, and there it is, the big pull shot rattling in to make it 2-1. We're going to see a lot of switching over on the left side of the table. Justin likes to be, as he should, the, the power player on the team in both offensive and defensive situations. Turner chipping this one up. One lead early on for Shaw and Constante. Like Laura is going to shoot this one, and she's going to score it. Nicely done as Laura Constante up in that forward position makes it 3-1. Justin Shaw, you have to wonder, I suppose, and of course 
Justin and Laura, a, a couple. And the left hook here of, by Turner. But you have to wonder, if, if even if Justin said, let's, uh, let's switch, let's call the timeout, whether uh, Laura would have. Uh, not making any sort of statement at all about who might wear the pants in, in that family. Attempt blocked by Michelle back the other way. Laura able to pick up the rebound. Alan Turner. 3-2 lead early on for Justin Shaw and Laura Constante. It's mixed doubles action. Allen will set up the pull kick and angle it in nicely. Alan Turner has tied it at three here in game number one. Three here in gate number one as Shaw sets it up. And strokes it home to make it 4-3. Again, the switch. Justin Shaw, who does go about things in a different fashion, but is really good at both positions. A defensive, good offensive goalie, very good forward, good five. Just a good all-around table soccer performer. Five, and a timeout call. Justin Shaw will return to the forward position. And there we are. That's me, Jim Stevens. That's Brad Lorene. Nice to Hi, have you, Brad. You. Thank you. Our first guest of the day is our good friend Brad Lorene, the man behind Rodlock, and also a guy who is uh, integral as far as Northwest table soccer goes, a, a man who is certainly part of the Hall of Legends committee out of the state of Oregon. It's good to have you, Brad. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, thanks to me, and I'm glad you're here, buddy. Always fun to come up here. And the good beer. Do they have beer up here? <laughs> I know they have coffee up here in Seattle. There's a Starbucks. Big, big a company. Humble. Yeah. But actually, I think you can find a lot of little coffee houses that uh, might even be better than Starbucks. Justin Shaw hoping to be better than Turner and Neal here in this first game as he sets it up looking to win game number one. Trying to come near side. There's Michelle to make the block and take it away. You know, I've got a, a set of rod locks at, at home, and Amy and I put them on the table when we're playing goalie. War, but it's also a really good practice tool as well. And... Uh, I know you didn't necessarily create the idea, but you've been the man behind Rodlock now for, for how long? Uh, it's been almost 20 years, and um, it's great to have Rodlock out there in the foosball community, and it's been a wonderful tool for people to be able to learn and just practice and don't have to reach for the uh, men every time they hit into it or something, of course, and it just makes it uh, a little bit more livable as a practicing uh, uh, and also goalie warrior tool. Now, do you have a website or, or is it I all do. catalogs? Or? And it's a website, rodlock.com. Go to that, and you could buy it on um, multiple sites, foosball.com, tornado foosball, 
Um, also, foosgear.com also sells it for us. All right. Well, Justin Shaw sells that last shot as he puts away game number one. It's one game to nothing. That was a good close game. Looks like they're going to change sides or uh, something's going on there. Let's see. Looks like Allen. Yep, there yep. he comes. Coming around the table. Justin Shaw really is actually one of our uh, better players, if not our best player out of the Pacific Northwest. He uh, comes out of what state is that that, that uh, he was originally in? I believe he's Iowa? from Iowa yeah, originally. Yeah, he was yeah. Iowa also. Yeah, him and his girlfriend are currently uh, playing here in the mixed doubles, doing a great job. He's a great competitor, good guy. I really enjoy uh, having him around us. The, the modern Northwestern player, Pacific Northwest player. Of course, such a history here in this part of the country. It's where tournament soccer was located. So many Hall of Famers. In fact, we did the Hall of Legends ceremony a little earlier on, and I was reading the list of names that are in the Northwest Hall of Legends, and and probably uh, there was probably 12 or 15 of them that were also in the National Hall of Fame. Yeah. So quite a quite a tradition, quite a quite a history up here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, Lee Pepper came out of the Seattle area and brought tornado, excuse me, uh, tournament soccer to the greatness that it had all throughout the nation and realistically it was the biggest tour at all money times it was oh huge. yeah no it was uh, it was one of the biggest sports in the country at, at that time there you see brad and i of course uh, no school left behind uh, football clubs usa head over to their site as we talked about and get involved with the kids well, the kids are going to be our future, Jim, and it's really looking that. great that uh, John is uh, bringing it up to speed here to where we're going to have it out there in the schools, and hopefully we'll be able to get some strong clubs right here in the Seattle area with uh, Alan Turner bringing one of the uh, uh, brainchilds for the Seattle area with that. He's been doing a great job really focusing on the kids in his school. All right, Clay Toomey sitting uh, at home in North Texas. Uh, bringing us some stats, Alan Turner in that first game, four for eight, passing it 50%, two for four, shooting at 50%. Michelle Neal did a nice job of clearing the zone uh, at 100%, four for four. You see Justin Shaw is going to open up game number two at goal. Shaw in that first game, just two for nine, passing, and I think maybe Laura had a pass in there as well. Three for five overall shooting, two for four for Shaw. I believe Laura was one for one when she shot it, and they cleared at 64%. Justin Shaw was able to pick one up from goal when he was back there, and certainly something he is well capable of doing. He blasts that ball from that two rod. He just absolutely has a cannon. He is a big, strong dude. He's, he's tall, lanky, and he's got arm and hand speed to go with it. He's just a real savvy player. Back there now, looking to shoot it. Shaw taking some time, trying to go with a pull kick, knocked down, grabbing on the five here by Laura. Looks like she's going to go ahead and pass. She did wait and hesitate just a second to see if Justin wanted her to make the call. Michelle Neal. Off the inside wall, picked up here by Turner. And you're playing with Alan Turner, are you not? I am in open doubles. We are uh, teamed up together. You are. All right. And then we'll also be playing in the senior doubles, although, of course, I hardly qualify for that. I didn't know that. I, I assumed you'd been qualified for many years, Brad Lurie. <laughs> well, maybe two or three now. All right. Fair enough. Oh, beautiful oh. shot there by Michelle Neal as she brings Great. it over, comes back to that short side to make it one nothing. Beautiful shot. These two teams fighting for their tournament life in this event. In this match, as the loser of this one would finish fifth in mixed doubles. You saw Turner drop the pass, picked up again by Shaw. Up the table and then grabbed by the quick-handed Justin Shaw. Shaw tried to take it back out to that far side. Blocked by Neal, doing a nice job on both sides of the ball. And good save here by Laura.
Yeah, if you get a chance, uh, if you are not a subscriber to the Inside Foods TV YouTube channel, if you're watching at YouTube on our channel, head down to that lower right corner to uh, subscribe. And each time we put up a new video, each time we go live, you will be notified. Turner's shot attempt blocked and taken away by Constante. Shot on goal by Laura. Michelle Neal. Turnover by Michelle. Hopefully it's not too costly here. Justin will shoot a snake shot here. You never really know what Justin's going to do, and we've seen him score two or three in a row of these and then never shoot it again <laughs> because he does have so many different options, and he has a, certainly his own way of approaching the game, and it's been a very successful one for him. Former national champion, former multi-goalie war champion. I believe he won forward shootout at the World Championships in Lexington uh, this year. I think he did too, actually. Um, he's, he's just such an eclectic player. He has such a tool bag to be able to draw from everything in there. Under the sun, he just shoots five bars, he shoots three bar, two bar. He just, just slams it forward all the time, always going. And he can catch the ball just radically. Difficult catches, he just snags them. He'll put the ball back into play here, looking for the lead here in the second game. Shot attempt blocked by Turner, who switched back there. Shaw again will look to advance at five to three. Bring any live action. Oh, oh that smooth oh, weaving left hook by Shaw. Speaking of unusual plays, there's Justin Shaw coming up with a big one. It's 2 1, and even he enjoyed that one. Yeah, big as, smiles. As did Alan Turner on the other side of the table, although Alan perhaps a little less than Justin. Alan trying to pass it along the outside wall. And Alan has a little bit of quirkiness in his game as well. But, you know, that's one thing I noticed, and I actually played foosball last night, Brad Lorene. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you know that, but I did get I out there did. and play, played a bunch of matches. And the one thing I noticed was I faced very few snake shots. I faced pull kicks, I faced push kicks, pull shots, front pins, but very few snakes. Seems there's something that's disturbing um, in the background here, but your push kick looked absolutely blazing last night. The two times that I saw you shoot it. Twice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. But uh, the Pacific Northwest was the home of the table soccer associations and, and the play that they had. They didn't have the snake shot back then. They had the pull shot barely, but it was always pull kicks and push kicks you'd see so often yeah. up here. Up in this part of the country, yes. yeah, yeah, no doubt. Texas more renowned as pull shot territory. Yes. And then, of course, with Jim Woodswell up in Minnesota. Look at the second effort there by Shaw. It's 3-1. He was blocked on the first one, reacted, and sent it in to make Smashed it 3-1. And that's Justin Shaw for you, folks. Yeah, and actually, uh, the snake shot, I believe, would have been illegal back in those days. It yes. would have been against the rules. Yes. Not that maybe you could have performed it anyway. I think the first snake shots, I believe, were shot perhaps at the tail end of the tournament soccer era. And again, the, there's some pounding in the background that seems to be disturbing Alan Turner. Where do you think the snake shot developed from, Jim? You know, there's always that controversy out there. People kind of say this or that, or, and who made the uh, first initial uh, impact with that shot? Who do you see? Uh, the snake shot? Yes. Um, at this stage, I credit, now, there are players in Europe who suggest that, um, and there's Turner with a big pull kick. Wow, Make it 3-2. That's a big shot there for Allen. Nice shot. Hans Friedrich Kircher over in Germany, actually. Mm. Uh, they call him the Jet because that was what they called that shot, the snake shot back then. And I think he traces it back to the late 70s, early 80s. In this country, it was the Hall of Famer out of Texas, John Smith, who first used it on tour uh, in the early 1980s. So Terry Moore who probably brought it to the most prominence out there, I yep. would think, on the uh, tour, was not the initial inventor of it, nope. but he was the one that uh, developed it and made it into a shot that really was uh, well, harkened to nothing like we've seen before in the numbers of, well, I guess Tony Spenderman with his role as a uh, player with What's the number of wins. Terry was the first guy to win with it, is yeah. what it was. He was yep. the first guy to win a, a tournament. I want to say 1992 was uh, Terry's first open win. I actually saw the shot um, previous to that, and mm. it, or even at three. Mm. 
Turner and Neal getting back into it here. But it certainly revolutionized the sport. First time I ever saw it was in 1989 uh, when the Tornado Table first came to Southern California. And uh, a few players there had been back east and had seen the shot and were using the shot. Uh, one guy named Gary Cacciatore out of New York, actually, uh, living in Southern California. I haven't thought of him in a long time <laughs> until now. Yeah. Yeah. But we were all kind of surprised and amazed and wondering if it was legal. Little did we realize that Terry Moore, who in 1989 was still a rookie. And would, he was in San Diego then, was in San he? Diego. Yeah. Who would, would see what Gary Cacciatore and a few others in Southern California were doing. And Terry took it. Ended up really making a Hall of Fame career out of it. It's Justin Shaw now will set it up. And that one goes wide of the goal. Rebound grabbed by Michelle Neal. 3-3 here in the second game. Jim Stevenson, Brad Lorene, special guest. Mr. Rod Locke himself. As we open up our primetime foosball live from Seattle here at uh, the YouTube, TV, YouTube channel, Inside Foods TV. Also brought to you by uh, the good folks, of course, over at uh, Football Clubs USA. And that one angled into the goal by Michelle. Three in a row from Alan Turner and Michelle Neal. And they are up 4-3 here in the second game, in a game that they had to have. Ooh. It is. He's practicing. Yeah, could have made that call. I think we would have supported it. Ball but into play by Shaw. Bounce pass. Can't connect on it. Sent back the other way by Michelle. Picked up here by Laura. And Laura Constante is going to call timeout. Bring Justin back there in an offensive situation. This is a tight match. Things have certainly tightened up here on table number one. Nice crowd here this weekend. Players, of course, from uh, north of the border. A lot of Canadians British Columbia, here, yeah. Alberta. But, uh, good showing from the Canadians. Up from Portland, Oregon, a lot of uh, Oregonians here. A few from um, Idaho. Mm -hmm. A couple even from Montana. Utah uh, as Utah well. Utah as well. That's Colorado, right. that would be me. That would be you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for making the trek out here. And Chad D. Tommaso out of California. Yeah. Let's come up here as well. well nice, nice turnout for this uh, outstanding regional event up here in the Pacific Northwest. I had not been up uh, in this region in almost 20 years to do a tournament. Of course, we came to Portland uh, back in March to work the Moneyball event. We'll be back there again next year. With, uh, Don Caesar and Kobe Cam doing such a nice job with that event. So keep an eye on the schedule. That one will be uh, coming up soon. Uh, coming uh, announcements will be made soon about when the dates of that one would be. Of course, the next event on the tournament schedule, the Colorado State Championships. We'll talk more about that as as time goes by, we are 24 minutes into our three-hour primetime foosball event here at Inside Foos TV and NetFoos.tv. And now Alan Turner with a chance to send this one to a third game. Shooting against Justin Shaw. Turner. That knocks that one back to his own five and then tried to shoot it. And we'll get another chance here. That's Shaw back there defending. will use a little clock, take it across. Looking at that cut angle. Tries it, goes just wide of the goal. I think Shaw was actually baiting him for it, hoping he would go for that angle. Turner almost able to make the steal here. That's Constante up there trying to pass. And it's Michelle Neal, who has played some good defense and provided some offense as well here in this second game, getting her team or helping to get her team back into it. Shell down the middle, picked up here by Laura. Mixed doubles action in the loser's bracket for fourth place or better. Yeah, certainly you, you mentioned Justin Shaw as perhaps being the best player up in this part of the country, and you're probably right about that. I mean, Cody Byrie. Another outstanding player who was here this weekend. Yeah, Robbie Hi Hayes as well. Robbie Hayes. Yeah. Very, very good player. We got a timeout. 4-3 lead here in the second game for Alan Turner and Michelle Neal. Justin Shaw, Laura Constante leading one game to nothing. Justin and Laura are in Oregon. And then we have um, Alan and Michelle. They're both out of the Seattle area here. Yeah. Well, Jim, how are you enjoying the Pacific Northwest? Love the Pacific Northwest. I like coffee. I like the occasional beer. As many of you know, I, I do enjoy a good IPA now and again. 
And this is kind of the home almost. Uh, the Northwest is the home of some of those uh, quality microbreweries. Certainly one of them. Yeah, no, no question about it. But uh, also like the people up here, like the history. Well, thank you, Jim. Country I itself. That. Yeah, it was nice of you. About which part? The history of the people. <laughs> uh, indeed. Good to see you, Jim. Darn it. Good to be seen, Brad. <laughs> Good to be alive, Brad. <laughs> Shout out to my kids watching back in Durango, Colorado, Ari and Kian. Ari is eight years old now, turned eight last month. Kian is five, going on 35 pounds. <laughs> Ball put back into play by Michelle Neal. Jim and Brad having some fun. Not the usual Brad that I have with me. Uh, no, Brad Anderson uh, normally fills the issues a lot better than I can. Picked up here by Turner. Allen has had a chance to send this one to a third game and has not been able to yet. He'll get another one here as he's able to take this one away from Laura. Looking at the pull shot. Is he really, though? No. He'll just kill a little clock here, bring it across and back. He will go into a push kick for me. It's like a pull kick here. Checking the angle. Boy, taking a lot of time here, and that shot attempt blocked by Laura. The rebound comes back to Allen. Again, Turner with a good, long, hard dink to win game number two. And we are even at one game apiece. That was a tight match. Turner really working the clock those last couple of possessions. I think the previous one was somewhere around 17 or 18. This one was about 14 before he executed that squared off split, which on the kick shots is an important option to have. Ooh, we've got a bent handle here. Bent rod, excuse me. And we're going to have to change a rod live on YouTube. Well, this is where that uh, flexing the rod new rule that comes into play here in 2019. Both players, Allen and Justin, do flex that rod prior to actually hitting the ball. It's not good. Well, it's a two rod, and I don't recall Allen even being back there on no, the two no, no. rod. Well, he does so. on the, the three rod, excuse me. He flexes yeah. it you know, tremendously. Well, I think I should go over and try and fix that two yeah, rod. Yeah, see what you can do. All right. I remind you once again, the School Foosball Clubs, you can volunteer your time, you can be a donor, a sponsor at Foosball Clubs USA. We're going to update you on the stats here in a minute as well. And of course, IFP, Mary Moore and uh, her outstanding tour. We're going to have a, a list of upcoming events here for you uh, momentarily as well. And uh, in fact, I think we can probably show that to you now. it is upcoming November 8th through 10th the Colorado State Championships in Thornton Colorado one week later down in uh, New Orleans Louisiana the Louisiana State Championships that's November 14th through 17th and then of course the, the new season will start at the end of January the 23rd to 26th in Lexington Kentucky and that will be the IFP tour kickoff As it looks, look at the stats so far for Justin Shaw, who has played both positions a significant amount of the time. Just three for 15 passing it. Three for nine shooting the ball. They're clearing uh, at six of 13. Laura Constante, four of eight when she's been back there to clear. Alan Turner. 7 of 20, passing the ball, again, just 35%. 4 for 10, shooting it, 40%. Michelle, who's done a nice job, has, uh, has scored three from goal so far. And she's really been the hero of the match, I think, so far. Uh, while also clearing at 67%.
Third game underway. It's been a good one so far. And quickly on the scoreboard is Shaw to make it one nothing. Michelle Neal has scored three so far in this match from goal. Three of the five in that last game. Alan Turner. Let's go up close and personal with the presumed pull kick of Eldwood Foods. Alan Turner shooting against Shaw. And he again finds that short corner. Really sold it nicely, took his time, gave a good quick movement to get Justin off the hole. Sent that ball into the near corner. We're tied at one here in this third game. Shaw, tic-tac wall pass. Shooting for the lead, Justin Shaw. And he strokes that one home to make it 2-1. And the switch. And just like that, we're even at two. Interesting uh, stat so far provided by Clay Toomey. The average time of possession on the three rod for these two players. Allen, 14 seconds. Average time of possession on the three rod. 14 for Allen Turner. Justin Shaw, 11.7. Both players really taking their time nicely. Boy, to have an average time of 14, that means you had to have exceeded 15 probably a couple of times. Goes less here, able to fire it home. It's 3-2. Justin Shaw now finding himself and his partner behind for the first time in the match. They jumped ahead early in game number one, and they were up 3-1 in game number two. Seven of the next nine goals have gone to Turner and Neal. Justin dances with it, trying to come along that near wall. Shaw again. Sends that one on goal. There's that smooth left hook. Michelle was able to make the block, but couldn't grab the rebound. Shaw again will set up the snake shot. Looking to tie it up at three here in this third game, Justin Shaw. Takes his time and strokes it home. It's 3-3. Three, three. And perhaps we are going to get an official. Let's see, Alan Turner walking away, looking for someone to uh, perhaps keep time. like our, our friend Brad Lorene is going to step in to uh, officiate the match. You see Brad? And uh, Alan Turner was correct in his assessment of Justin Shaw's possession time on that three rod. 17 seconds, exceeding the limit by two seconds. here by Turner. Tied up at three here in the third and final game of this mixed doubles match. Turner along that outside wall, knocked back towards the goal and in. So Turner went with that wall pass to the far side and then inadvertently on the reaction play, knocked it with his own five right back into his own goal and it's match point for Justin Shaw and Laura Constante. 
Turner pressuring this one through the lane, looking to send this match down to one final ball. Now there is a timer, but he doesn't need one here as he takes about three seconds before going with that quick dink. It is 4-4 here in the third game. Justin Shaw will put it into play. You'll always have to watch out for the left hook from Shaw. He weaves, looks, and nails it, just as we talked about. Justin Shaw and Laura Constante survive in this mixed doubles match as they move on to fourth place or better. Alan Turner and Michelle Neal finish fifth. All right, folks, a good way to, to get our uh, three-hour primetime foosball event underway. With uh, Justin Shaw and Laura Constante winning in three games. All right, folks, we're going to do our first uh, trivia question of, of the weekend here in just a minute. So get ready. I think it's a pretty good one. I, I do think someone's going to get it. But we'll throw this trivia question out there for you. Uh, if you uh, are able to answer it, and the way you would answer it, let's go over the, the actual system of doing it. If, uh, if you can send me a, a Facebook message with what you think is the correct answer. The first message I receive will win a set of, uh, of their choice, Tornado World Championship videos, downloads, or if you already have that one, then uh, something else. We're going to have a special guest as well here uh, coming up momentarily. And we're also going to look at the final stats from those once we can we can pull those up uh, as well. But right now, um, joined in the booth by Mr. Mike Donaldson, and we had a chance earlier to talk to you on Facebook Live and talk a little bit about your involvement with the uh, with the, with this event and the history of it, and of course uh, uh, up here in this part of the country as well. So, so welcome aboard, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, about almost ten years ago, I think I uh, I wanted to get the foosball scene a little bigger in the Northwest, mm -hmm. and so I. Came up my very first uh, Washington State Open, WSO as we call it, was in a little bar in the east side of Seattle called in Kirkland. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, I think, uh, over 100 registers, registered players for that. Turned out really well. Um, I have to say one thing about that. They, the bar wanted to close early on us. Uh -huh. So our, our finals in the open doubles was out on the sidewalk. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, they... they now, now, hold on. Uh, and this is in Seattle, right? Yeah, well, uh, east of we're, Seattle. We're, 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 it rains 350 days a, a year. Right, yeah. This was, um, I think at that time it was in June, so we were we lucked out. It doesn't rain in June. It, well, no, I can't say that either. <laughs> we like to tell people that so that we don't flood our state with a lot of people, but yeah, it, it was pretty good. Uh, it was pretty funny, though, because um, they kicked us out and I said, well, we got to finish this. And I said, can I take the tables out there? And they're like, all right. So we had uh, Robbie Hayes, by the way, master around here. He pulled his truck up and flashed his headlights on us. Uh -huh. And besides that, we had a couple of overhead outside uh, sidewalk lights on us to finish this match. It was crazy. That is funny. That, uh, that is funny. It was a lot of fun. Um, and that worked out really well. And I just took the ball and ran with it. And um, in 2012, uh, well, actually after that, I moved it to a hotel because uh -huh. I wanted to get the, the kids involved because yep. they're the future of the sport. They sure are. So um, we had a couple of junior events. We had an over and under where we paired the seniors with the juniors, give the senior experiences with the young enthusiasm, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And that worked out pretty good. We didn't, we only did it for a few years, but it was still a lot of fun. Um, so then in 2012, I thought, well, we need to start honoring everybody around here. And that's when I came up with the Hall of Legends. Mm -hmm. And I like to point out that yeah. I call it the Hall of Legends because anybody can be famous. That's right. But not everybody can be a legend. Yeah. So that was my point on that. I think it's great. I, I love that you kind of have changed it a little bit, and it certainly describes perfectly uh, what you did introduce. And now 37 members of the Hall yeah. of Legends. Yeah, it's great. our four new ones here this, yeah. this weekend. We, we were kind of going to go, we, we wanted to you know, get the base of everybody from back in the golden age. So we started with, I think, uh, 12, I think, the, the first year. And then we were only going to do like three or four every year after that. But a couple years we had five, a couple years we had three. And it just worked out where everybody seems to be pretty happy with who got in. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, they all love it, I think. I mean, there's probably some you know, detractors, but there's always going to be somebody like that. Well, and, and it's, uh, it's really great what you've done up here. Of course, so much history in this part of the country. And you're kind of continuing that history, not only with your Hall of Legends, but just in terms of foosball promotion, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that the sport carries on up in, in the Pacific Northwest. Right. I, um, I'm, I'm kind of winding down myself, but except for the Hall of Legends. Um, but a couple of years ago, I started working with George Barda, who's kind of taken the baton from me. I think he's doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. I'm, I kind of consult and help him with this and that. and I proof his flyers and things like that. So he's doing a really good job, and I'm really happy to hand it off to him. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, keep up the good work up here. And we, of course, enjoy coming up here to the Pacific Northwest, our second time up here this year after Moneyball in Portland back in right. March. And, and thanks again for joining us, and thanks for what you do. Right. Well, great to have you, Jim. All right, folks, that's Mike Donaldson, one of, the, one of the movers and shakers up here in the Pacific Northwest. All right, we've got another match about to start here on table number one. During this three-hour period, we are 44 minutes and two seconds into our three-hour primetime event here at uh, Inside Foods TV and NetFoods.tv. And again, uh, we'd love for you to become a subscriber here at uh, Inside Foods TV. If you're not watching there, head on over there and just click that, uh, that little picture of me in the lower right corner and become a subscriber every time we put new content up on our Inside Foods TV channel, which we're going to do uh, oh, a couple times a month coming up here. And... Uh, including a, a, a really exciting release um, here in a couple of weeks. Uh, I call it the, the Clash of the Titans. It's the 2006 uh, tour kickoff open doubles final between Frederick Cole and Yon Todd Lafredo going up against none other than Billy Pappas and Tony Spradamon. Don't forget, there's Rodlock, the best practice tool. And, of course, in four weeks, we'll be up uh, in Thornton, Colorado, for the Colorado State Championships. All right, we've got some more live foosball for you. As this one opens up with Justin Shaw trying a left hook, and eventually the rebound comes back to... There he is. That is Tom Henricks in the goalie position. Justin Shaw at forward. Back at goal. That is David Kala, and that's Teddy Sprouse at forward. one nothing lead early on here for Shaw and Henricks. Best two games out of three. And by the way, this is the winner's bracket final of the double draw round two. One one here in game number one. Unblocked blocked a bit of the air and off the table. David Kala will put it back into play. And fire it home. Nicely done by Kala.
And firing at home here is Teddy Sprouse. Teddy, the, the one player out of the state of Utah who's here this weekend out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Accomplished player, former Pro Doubles champion at the Hall of Fame Classic a few years ago with Steve Simon. Shaw likes to set that pull shot well behind the rod, shooting against Nabu Kala and finds that hole down the middle here against the reverse of Kala. It's 3-2. Again, we're seeing Shaw, as we saw in the mixed doubles match previously, switching a significant amount of the time, and there is a nice brush up here by Teddy Sprouse. And he fires it home. Teddy shooting it well so far. It's 4-2. Teddy two for two shooting it. Goes nicely along the wall, can't hold on to it, stabs it forward. Picked up here by Henricks. Fired on goal by Tom. Rebound grabbed by Shaw. Comes back to that near corner off the roll. Nicely done. It's 4-3. Boy, he's just so creative. He comes up with these things on the fly. He's such a feel player, a rhythm player, talking about Shaw. And Justin will defend here as Teddy will set it up, looking to win game number one. Strauss comes down the middle, blocked back the other way, picked up here by Henricks. We'll call time out. And stroking at home. Here is Shaw. We're even at four. And again, the switch. Henrik's moving up. Shaw moving back. Sprouse putting it into play. One first game action here in the winner's bracket final of double draw number one. I'm also going to bring you some open doubles action here. Shortly, it's Teddy. Walks it around. Strokes it back down the middle. It's one game to nothing. All right, sec second game underway, and there is Sprouse opening it up, stroking it home. So Teddy continuing to shoot it well. 1-0 lead, rather 1-1. As they got this game going quickly, didn't they? Didn't give us much of a, of a chance for a break. And when you're on the air live for three consecutive hours, you need the occasional break, I suppose. Again, if you'd like to contact me, let me know you're out there watching. You want a shout out? Um, send me a, a, a Facebook message, Jim Stevens. Shout out to Clay Toomey. Teddy, again, disguising the brush nicely, brushing it down, setting it up against Henricks. That shot attempt up into the air and off the table. Looking at the numbers after game number one, Justin Shaw will put it back into play. Teddy Sprouse, three for five passing, four for five shooting. Great first game performance from Utah's Teddy Sprouse. David Kala cleared at 100%, one for one. And scored one from goal. Justin Shaw, four for five passing, 80%, 60% shooting at three for five. And Henriksen Shaw cleared it at one for three. 33% did not score a goal from the two rod. But Teddy Sprouse has really played well. To give his team the lead here in the second game, Sprouts. That shot attempt blocked away by Shaw, who is back there. Comes back to Kala. And we've got a timeout.
might have been one here in game number two. One game to nothing lead for Teddy Sprouse and David Kala. Shaw able to get that one through and off the post and in. Gets 2 1. Sprouse along the wall. Teddy again hammering home that far corner. Boy, he's really shooting it aggressively and successfully so far. Another possession here. And down the middle this time. What a great performance from Teddy Sprouse as he has given his team a 3-2 lead here in the second game, already leading one game to nothing. And the left hook. It's match point. Dominating performance from Teddy Sprouse and David Kala. Sprouse in particular has been sensational. Shaw able to pick this one up. Set it up, blocked and taken away by Kala. And to clear it along the outside, well, let's get the ball to Teddy is what he's thinking, and wisely so. Stolen away here, though, by Shaw. Justin tried to come back to that near corner again as he did earlier on. This time, Kala was there to make the block. He comes back to Shaw. Down the middle he goes with a snake shot, hops up into the air, and comes back to Justin. Shaw has it taken away by David Kala. He sends that one up the table on goal, and there's Teddy to pick it up with a chance to win it. Teddy Sprouse strokes it home, and just like that in two straight games, Teddy Sprouse, David Kala, advance to the final of the double draw with an outstanding performance here on table number one. You know, many seasoned players want to give back to the sport they love. And working with Foosball Clubs USA, it's one way to pass on your love of foosball to the next generation. And again, contact John O'Brien. Discuss your interest in, in helping, whether it's through volunteership, whether it's through donations. And uh, if you're interested in uh, certainly starting a program of your own, you can email him at foosballclubsusa at, at gmail.com uh, or just head over to foosballclubsusa.com to get more information. But... Uh, Let's keep it going, folks. Let's uh, spread to what we know is a great sport to, uh, to the kids. All right, Jim Stevens uh, with you again, sitting here with the Hall of Famer. Kenny Rivera, nice to have you. Kenny, of course, one of the legends of the Pacific Northwest, and a real pleasure to have you up here with us. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here. 
I want you to know how excited we are and thrilled for you to come to our uh, 2019 Northwest Foosball Hall of Legends Tournament. It's just an honor to have you here. And we're well, excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. That's very kind of you. Um, let's talk a little bit about your history. Of course, um, you go all the way back, I, I guess, 1975 was a, was a big year for you in, in, in table soccer with playing with Dan Kaiser. Talk a little bit about the early days of, of Northwest Pacific Northwest foosball and the major tour in general. Well, myself personally, I moved to Portland because that's where the best foosball in the Northwest was. That's where the best competition was. And then in 1974, at Elitch's Park in yep. Denver, Colorado, sure. there was a $50,000 tournament. The first big the, tournament. The first mega tournament, yep. yes. Won by Joe Purcell and Gordy Samakawa from mm -hmm. here in Renton, Washington. So uh -huh. that, was, that was my first introduction to big time foosball. And when I saw that, I, if I wasn't hooked before, I was you after sure that. Then, it sure it? was. That had to be exciting. And then, uh, of course, you paired up with uh, another Hall of Famer, one of the great players of all time, Dan Kaiser. Dan Kaiser, mega superstar. Mm -hmm. uh, I, pay, I paired up with him midway through the 75 tour. Uh, it was a quarter million dollar tour, and I was fortunate enough to play with him. We had su initial success, and we decided to pair up in the Nationals, and it worked out real good for us. We ended up winning the, the championship, and... The first super mega tournament, uh, first place was $20,000. Right, and, yeah. And we played in a $31,000 match to get there. So Wow. What an excitement. Yeah, and of course, I guess, uh, was it uh, 79, the uh, the $250,000, maybe the biggest tournament ever, the World Championships? I think you had a pretty decent weekend there as well. Yeah, I, I teamed up with uh, Paul Reynolds from Columbus, Ohio, a great, great player. Mm -hmm. And we ended up third. Uh, we lost on meatball, match point, 5-4. Uh, another heartbreak you know but you can't win them all uh, Paul Reynolds was a great player yeah. it was a great tour I think that was a million dollar first million dollar tour that yeah. year yeah and when, when you have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar individual tournament I suppose getting to a million isn't all that difficult um, and then a few years ago you had the honor of being inducted into the National Hall of Fame talk a little bit I, and I had a chance to talk with you then and since then and I know how much this means to you to, to be in that very special class of players but talk a little bit about your feelings about uh, becoming a part of that very exclusive club. Well, I had dropped out of foosball for about 30-some years, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was going on. I'd mm -hmm. gone back into the real world, and when I came back, I saw a lot of the players that I was still playing with back in the day, and I started showing up a little bit, and I found out from Michael Donaldson that I'd been nominated for the Hall of Legends, and I thought, hey, that's a great honor, you know? And then when I found out I'd, I'd been selected for it, I was so thrilled. I mean, beyond belief. It was, I couldn't have even expected anything like that. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to have you back. And you mentioned how you took so much time away. Um, when, when you came back, how, how had things changed? Obviously, the snake shot and some of the other, the other things. But, but talk a little bit about uh, how different uh, the, the tour was. Well, the game itself was totally different. It was on a different table, different men, different playing characteristics. I had to completely relearn the game uh, on the, on the other table, I had put thousands of hours on. This table, I just have hundreds of hours on. Yeah. So the top yeah. pros, you know, they're, they're playing six, eight hours every day. Yeah. You know, I play six, eight hours in, in about two or three months. So right. I don't right. get much time to practice on it. But it's a great table. Tournament, uh, the Tornado Tail is a great table to play on. Great banking characteristics, great table to play on. But I just haven't had time to uh, sure. get the experience that I did on the other table. But it's a great table. Um, George Barda is throwing the tournament this weekend doing a great great job uh, it's it's just a thrill to have somebody backing us so well mm -hmm. uh, we're thankful to him for the honor of having this tournament now one thing we're seeing on the tour these days is uh, we're seeing an increase in the number of players who are returning now not all of them take off 35 years uh, right. as you did but um but we are seeing the return to the tour right, of right of a lot of the old-time players their, their kids are grown now they have good jobs or are retired and, um, and and now they, they see it on YouTube. They say, wow, I, I still have that passion for them, love for the sport. And we're seeing a lot of them coming back to the tour. And I know you experienced that. Yours was yeah. a little longer than most. But you're also running into a lot of old friends, aren't you? Oh, that's the great thing about this tournament, the Northwest Hall of Legends tournament. Uh, we have the young, young players who are just, uh, this is like their first tournament. But then we have a lot of the old timers. Uh, there are probably 30 or 40 people here that I've known for 40 years mm -hmm. that I've been playing foosball with and against for many years. And it's just a thrill to, 
to see them again, play against them, and rehash old times. And, uh, the greatest game ever played. Most of us played in the, gold, in the golden era of foosball, mm -hmm. and when it, it was just magic, and we're trying to get it back so it's the same way again. And, and before we let you go, kind of give, I, I know a lot of who we are um, uh, talking to out there at NetFoos and, and now YouTube uh, with our Inside Foods TV channel, really don't really have an idea of what it was like back then. The size of the tournaments, the excitement, the professionalism of it, the amount of money you were playing for. Uh, give us as, as much as you can, a, a little bit of a feel of, for what that million dollar, that tournament soccer tour was, was like. Well, we were lucky that we were born at the right time. We were the right age. Tournament soccer came along. We started playing foosball, the game we loved. And then all of a sudden we could win money playing the game that we love. And that made it just double great. And we're talking big dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, the money we won in uh, 75, if you take it in today's dollars, would be about oh, $48,000, I that, think. Yeah. I think I figured it out, a piece. <laughs> So it was just exci exciting to be able to do what you want, travel across the country, uh, tour to d uh, different tournaments, uh, meet people from all over the country, establish friendships that we've had uh, for 30, 40 years. It just so, so totally exciting. Uh, we go to tournaments that were 50,000, 100,000, quarter million, uh, just gigantic tournaments, and we were playing foosball, the greatest game ever made. Well, on that note, I will once again thank you for joining us, uh, one of the greatest players ever made. Thank you, Kenny Rivera, again, for spending a little time with us here at uh, the Inside Foos TV Th channel. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. All right, buddy. Bye-bye now. And good luck the rest of the weekend. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to look at the uh, the final stats from that last match uh, here in a minute. Mr. Clay Toomey sitting at home. Uh, apparently nothing better to do out there in, uh, in North Texas as he is providing some stats for us. And let's look at the numbers from that, that last one. Let's see uh, really how dominant uh, Teddy Sprouse was. And we're going to get a chance to see Teddy again in an open doubles match coming up here in just a minute. It's the great Ken Rivera uh, able to flash us one more thumbs up. There are the numbers. Teddy Sprouse, look at that. 73% passing, 73% shooting. Clearing 3-6 for David Kala. And David didn't have to do a whole lot, didn't have a whole lot of possessions. But 73% passing and shooting, that'll get it done. You saw Shaw 5 for 12. 42% passing, 40% shooting the ball, and the clearing of 40% of Tom Henrik. But it was the Teddy Sprouse show, certainly, in that last match. And we're going to get a chance to see Teddy again here uh, momentarily. All right, we've got open doubles down on table number one. There is the aforementioned. There is the aforementioned a uh, couple of times. Teddy Sprouse and his partner Ryan Harvey, a very good team. Harvey from Oregon, Sprouse from Utah. They'll be on the left. Over there on the right, out of Vancouver, British Columbia. In the forward position, that's Cam Burroughs. And at goal, Dylan Fong. Best three games out of five. It's winner's bracket in the round of 16.
One nothing lead early on for Sprouse and Harvey. We've been live now for an hour and six minutes, to two hours and 53 minutes and 15 seconds left in our primetime foosball event here from uh, Seattle, Washington. This is Cam Burroughs. We're going to try to get a chance to talk with Cam up here, uh, maybe after this match or a little later on. Cam is the president of the Canadian Table Soccer Federation, also the head of Vancouver Foosball. Doing such a great job up there in BC. And hopefully we get a chance to bring him up and have a conversation with him as well. Two one lead early on for Burroughs and Fuang. And speaking of Canadians. Joined by Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's Will Stranks. Hey Jim. There's Will, as soon as we come into focus. Uh, that could be me. Maybe I'm out of focus. A chance to watch a couple of your uh, fellow Canadians, including the president of the Canadian Federation, um, Cam Burroughs. Yeah, Cam and Dylan have been playing together for a while. Um, Cam's doing awesome things up in Canada, running uh, our national federation and helping get the World Cup and our national teams going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great to see Cam over in, in Spain and... Uh, the continuing growth of the Canadian program. But Canada, Canada is, is a big country. I don't know, uh, newsflash folks, Canada is big. But there really is a, a separation. You've got Western Canada, you've got way over there, Eastern Canada, um, in different styles of play. Certainly in, uh, in Quebec, you're getting a, more of a French style of play or an international style of play, whereas in Toronto, it is predominantly tornado. Out west, where you are in Edmonton, and of course in, in Vancouver, in Calgary, a tornado style of foosball but it but it's kind of nice i guess when you do put together your canadian team that you do have options such as some of the players from from quebec and in the, the bonzini style players and, and others to, to put together your team in a multi-table fashion yeah we're really lucky to have that i think um you know in quebec they play on garlando too a little bit mm -hmm. um tons of bonzini which is awesome for us and uh, i think it's just kind of starting to migrate west where a few more people are getting bonzini tables and trying to you know, learn different styles of games and be able to be a little bit more competitive at an international level. 4-2 lead here in this first game for the Canadians. Cam Burroughs and Dylan Fong. A nice pick up here by Cam and a chance to close out game number one, but first, a timeout. And you've had a chance to, to travel a little bit and be part of the Canadian team and, and talk a little bit about your experiences when, when going overseas and playing internationally. Going to the World Cup is the number one coolest thing in foosball right now. Um, getting to go over, especially when it was in France and Nantes, seeing the size of the crowds they have and you know, even just being able to watch the French team play and see what their crowd's like with people banging things and cheering. And I mean, it's not something you see in foosball very many places, so. Ryan Harvey, after the loss of the ball by Cam Burroughs, able to grab it and put it in to make it 4-3. But, you know, you tell people about it, and, of course, more and more uh, the North Americans um, are represented in, in greater numbers at, uh, at the World Cup. But there really isn't anything quite like the World Cup event. Uh, as great as the Tornado World Championships are in the Hall of Fame Classic, as Teddy Sprouse now picks it up and looks to tie this first game up at four, and he does. It really takes the sport to, a, to an all-time all level uh, as far as uh, promotion, as far as the professionalism of it, the exposure. Like, as you said, we'd go to Nantes, and there'd be 1,500 locals sometimes even more than that, sitting in the crowd watching. You'd go downtown, you'd, you'd grab a beer, and they'd put it on a coaster with a picture of a Bonzini man on it, or you'd drive around and see posters and signs around town. And, and we will be returning to Nantes in two years for the next World Cup. But it really is as big as it gets. And there is Teddy Sprouse completing his team's comeback. Three in a row from Sprouse and Harvey, and they lead one game to nothing. What a comeback. Down 4-2, I think. They were down 4-2 just seemingly a minute and a half ago. And... Three in a row, makes it one game to nothing, and we're quickly going to get the second game underway. Talk about some of the players. Of course, many of us are aware of Mario Aragonello and Mario Iannuzzi, and of course, Kane Gabriel now living in America, but competed for uh, Team Canada, and yourself 
uh, outstanding players in Canada. That's four goals in a row now from Sprouse and Harvey, and they're up one nothing here in this second game. But you guys can put together a pretty strong team. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good players in Canada. Like you said, it's a really diverse or big country, so we have a hard time getting all our players together and really playing with each other. It's easier for us to come to the States when we play with each other than it is to travel in Canada to play just because of how far away our cities yeah. are. Yeah. And, and you flew here to Seattle, I assume. I it's did, a, it's yes. a bit of a long drive from Edmonton, certainly. I, I recall you brought me up to, to work the, the tournament at the mall in 2012, was that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I had a great time. Really awesome to come up there. But you're, Edmonton's way out there in the middle of nowhere. It's this big city of a million people in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah, it's really far north and it's really cold. Um, we have an awesome scene up there now. Uh, last Monday, we had 26 people at our DYP. And, and there's Harvey. Nice that job. one blocked back in to make it 3-1. And a timeout called. So Cam Burroughs, Dylan Fong come out to get three of the first four here in this uh, second game after they lost that first game. Nice turnaround here for the Canadian pair. And uh, we've got a timeout. Cam's been doing a really interesting thing with his five bar lately. Um, that pretty cool weave really moves the ball a lot and finds all sorts of options. And when he passes through, he really smokes it. So it's a pretty sweet five bar to watch, I think. And we'll keep an eye on that. All right. It has been a, a match of streaks, certainly. Sprouse and Harvey closing out that first game with three in a row. And now Burroughs and Fong coming back to get three of the first four here in game number two. Here's Sprouse. Shot attempt. Rebound comes back to Teddy. Of course, the last match we did, Sprouse in the DYP really put on a show, shooting 73%, passing 73% as he won the match in about eight minutes in a very impressive performance. All right, here's Burroughs looking to give his team a 4-1 lead, and he does. Now, I don't know how aware you are of the history of Canadian foosball, uh, but there were good Canadian players uh, playing on the tournament soccer tour and into the 80s on Dynamo, and, and, um, and I don't know whether you are, that's a little before your time, or how much you are aware of some of the, the, the old school Canadian players. Um, only the ones that still play. Uh, we don't have very much of a history book or any real records of who played. Uh, Mitch is here. Mm -hmm. Mitch Jang is yeah. here from Vancouver, and uh, he's a legend in Canada. When I started playing, I yeah. probably started playing in 09 and didn't meet him until maybe 2017, and all I'd ever heard is, Mitch is amazing. Just wait till you see Mitch. That shot at him by Burroughs, blocked but rattles in anyway, so we are even at one game apiece. We're joined right now by, by Will Stranks. Um, of Canada, of Edmonton, in Alberta, as we are bringing you action in open doubles. This match in the round of 16 of the winner's bracket here at the 2019 Washington State Open. Nice turnout here this weekend. Good job. Uh, what is it that brings you to this tournament? Now, I know you're actually one of the most successful players in the history of the Washington State Open. Talk a little bit about your accomplishments here. Yeah, um, the first time I really came to the States for a tournament was 2010 Washington State, and actually... There was four of us that drove down, and we won amateur doubles and open doubles in the same same tournament. Oh wow! And henceforth have been bumped to pro. So yeah. no uh, more no more amateur doubles for you. No more amateur doubles. I really coming down. I was hoping to win am and didn't think I had a shot at open. And just Christian Dunn, I was playing with, and he yep. was just on fire that weekend. And I was playing goalie for him. I was playing forward in amateur doubles, but that was the first one. And since then, I guess this is my eighth. Washington State Open. Wow, I believe okay. I won three and had a three second place finishes in yeah. open doubles. I'm guessing there is no one else that has quite uh, as accomplished a record as you. That's, that's impressive. Thanks. One game apiece, no score here in the third game. Oh, beautiful pass here. And again, you can see when you watch Burroughs and Fong play together how, how much of a team they are, the chemistry that they have, the familiarity with each other's games and that can go a long way and that's something we don't see so much anymore again we're going to reflect on history in the 1970s on the tournament soccer tour you had teams you had team names that's so cool but you had players who always played together uh we kind of got away from that i think during the 90s in particular on the tornado tour and you know, when players would would mix it up one star would play with another star and i think besides gummison and mcmillan and maybe one or two other exceptions uh we really lost a little bit of that and, and, and the chemistry that comes with that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And these guys are super, super close friends. I know they just spend time talking about football, not even playing necessarily, but just talking. And when you have that connection with somebody, I think it really helps understand what you're thinking at certain times. And, you know, so much of the mentality can be stronger because of teammates. One nothing lead here in the third game for Burroughs and Fong. Chance for Cam to increase his team's lead, but higher V back there to make the block. Ryan Harvey can be explosive offensively from goal. If anyone saw the money ball performance by Harvey from the goalie position when he was playing with Jeffrey Pipkin, it was very impressive. Hit some huge shots and hit a bunch of them. Ryan's game is awesome. It's about as exciting as it gets, especially as two bar, but even as three and five are great. So. Very, very explosive player. Absolutely. Yep. As can Teddy Sprouse be. We've had a chance, of course, Teddy, a former Pro Doubles champion in Las Vegas, and that's saying something. That is a very tough event to win, at either the Tornado Worlds or at the Hall of Fame Classic, and Teddy and his partner, Steve Simons, were able to win that title a few years ago. Yeah, they're probably a bit of a momentum team, Teddy and Ryan. Um, both extremely talented and players that if you get on a roll, they're going to just keep going. Whereas Cam and Dylan seem to be very consistent, play every ball at a high level, but maybe not the ebbs and flows, the peaks and valleys that you're going to get from Sprouse and Harvey, and from Harvey in particular. And that one up the table off a of man and in, and we're even at two. Switch from Ryan and Teddy here. Sprouse moving back, Harvey moving forward, and Ryan able to take it away and call time out. It's a good switch. We're tied up in one game apiece. We're even at two goals apiece. Open doubles action from the 2019 Washington State Open. As Sprouse steps back to the forward position and puts it back into play. And strokes it home to that far side. It's 3-2. Very productive switch. As the, uh, the pair on the left have surged back ahead. And Harvey brushing it down, grabbing it on the three rod, calling timeout to bring Teddy back to forward. If I'm Cam Burroughs and Dylan Fong, though, I'm taking that full 30-second timeout right there. The momentum has certainly switched to the left side of the table. Let's, let's let Teddy and Ryan slow things down a little bit. And there's Sprouse again fighting that near corner. But I'm a guy that thinks you should always take a minute and a half between games, and you should always take 30 seconds during timeout. So I wouldn't just. Well, I think you know better than anyone, Jim. And just like that, it's two games to one. Wow, talk about explosive. There it was, an explosion from the left side of the table as Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey now lead two games to one. If you got a little time, we'd like to keep you around till the end of the match. I know you're, you're also playing. Who are you playing open doubles with this weekend? I'm playing with Simon Edwards. Yeah. We lost already, so we're in the losers' oh. bracket. And it wasn't a hot start, but a uh, long way to go now. Yeah, you've just made the road a little longer, uh, is all. It certainly can happen, and uh, I hope it does. Yeah, we just tried to put the first one behind us after and you know be able to come out hard in the next one. but. Mm -hmm. See how it goes. All right, two games to one lead for Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey. This is Sprouse starting in the goalie position and stroking it home. Nasty shot. Another pickup here by Harvey. Boy, they don't lose much when they switch. They're both outstanding shooters from goal and forward. Interesting to see them switch after winning the last game and switching to start this one. Let's look at the numbers through three games. Wow. Cam Burroughs, just four for 16 passing the ball. That's 25%. He is eight for 14 shooting it at 57%. And we're even at one now here in this fourth game. Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey, 10 of 23 passing. That's 49%. 43% as I look more closely. And they are 8 of 14 shooting it. One of those was uh, Ryan Harvey, and the rest of them were Teddy Sprouse. So solid offensive numbers for Sprouse and Harvey, and they lead uh, two games to one, and now looking to take a 2-1 lead here in the fourth. And again, thanks to uh, Clay Toomey. Absolutely. Doing his thing, and everybody loves what Clay Toomey does. We don't get it enough. It, it, frankly. It's only been probably the last couple of years that we've even had any any real stats for foosball, but I think it's amazing. So much fun to watch and be able to 
you know, hear what people are doing and you can see by eye, but sometimes it's a lot better to actually see the numbers. Yeah, and especially when you have a guy like Toomey, who is a, a, a world-class typer, which then allows him to chart so many different things. I, I forgot what the exact number was. What is it, 114 different things you're, you're charting, Clay? All right, we're going to get a switch on the right side. Dylan moving forward with possession on the five. Cam moving back to goal. Harvey is in the forward position on the left side as Dylan Fong puts the ball back into play. Has that one knocked down by Harvey. It comes back to Sprouse. 1-1 here in the fourth game. Two games to one lead for Harvey and Sprouse. And there's a turnover as Sprouse hands it to Fong. That shot off the near corner. Rebound back to Teddy. Hope you're enjoying our live coverage from the Washington State Open at the Inside Foods TV channel at YouTube and, of course, at netfoods.tv. If you're not a subscriber of uh, the Inside Foods TV channel, get on over there if you aren't already. If you're there, just click that little picture of me in the lower right corner of the screen and become a member. And each time we post new content, whether it's live or recorded, you'll be notified. And you can head on over and uh, have a look at uh, what it is we're offering. And again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to release a, an Inside Foods classic. The four greatest players of all time, potentially, as Harvey grabs it. On the three rod, we'll call timeout and, and bring Teddy back to forward. Sprouse will shoot against Wong, who has moved back. But Frederick Colignon, Todd Lafredo versus Tony Spreadham and Billy Pappas at the 2006 Tour kickoff in Las Vegas in the Open Doubles Final. It was a good one, and you'll get a chance to watch that here in a couple of weeks. And there is Sprouse hammering it home to make it 2-1. Teddy's playing really confidently right now. You can see when he stepped up there, he just 100% believed he was going to score that shot. Yeah, he is. He really has been this last couple of matches we've had him here. It's... Not always the case with Teddy, but he has been very focused and dynamic in that forward position. Burroughs with a big possession here, able to find the back of the goal to make it 2-2. I think a little bit of patience paid off a long way there for Kim. And again, I think when you have a team rolling, as Sprouse and Harvey have been the last couple of games, you do want to slow the tempo down. You do want to take your full 30 seconds or a minute and a half, because right now there's no stopping Teddy Sprouse. He is on fire again. Nice little chip on that weave. This match has been played at a very fast pace, very intense pace. It's been a good one. That big pull shot from goal by Sprouse. Just playing with tremendous confidence. That one knocked back towards the goal. Teddy able to keep it out. It's 3-2 here in the fourth game. Two games to one lead for Ryan Harvey and Teddy Sprouse. Remember that first game when Burroughs and Fong were up 4-2. Seemed to be in control and were playing very well. And the comeback, and it's been Harvey and Sprouse pretty much entirely then, since then. And the pull shot from Harvey gives Harvey and Sprouse a match point. This is Harvey rattling it through. He'll set it up against Burroughs looking to win the match. Swings and misses on that one. Knocked back wide of the goal. This is Burroughs. Cam sent it along the outside wall towards the goal. Collected by Sprouse. Everybody's sort of sitting back and taking a breath now. This has been play played at quite a pace, quite a tempo so far. Oh, that beautiful pass along the inside wall. Long couldn't hold on to it. It comes back to Harvey. Another chance here for Ryan. He's going to call timeout, bring Teddy back to forward. Teddy Sprouse will put the ball back into play and look to win the match. Sprouse, shot attempt locked and taken away by Fong. Going to squirt through to the five of Burroughs, who digs it off that outside wall. Brings it near side. Weaves, trying to go through the lane. Sprouse got a man on it. Comes back to Fong. Dylan's shot goes wide. Burroughs able to grab the rebound. He'll set it up, looking to cut the lead to one here in this fourth game. And he does. Remains match point for Sprouse and Harvey. Teddy, along the wall, another chance 
to advance to the quarterfinals in open doubles. But Wong able to hold him off, and then Burroughs couldn't hold on to it, and Sprouts also losing it back to Dillon. And that one's stuffed back into the goal, and there it is. In four impressive games, Teddy Sprouse, Ryan Harvey, defeat Cameron Burroughs and Dylan Wong to advance to the quarterfinals in open doubles. All right, Will Strengths, thank you for, for joining us, and uh, good luck the rest of the weekend as you attempt to come back from that loser side in open doubles. Thanks a lot. Pleasure being up here, and right. uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, Will. All right, folks, about halfway through a primetime foosball lock from Seattle. We'll get some final stats for you on that one here coming up. But it does give us a, a chance to, uh, to remind you. Uh, about the Colorado State Championships, my home state, although where I live in Durango is about a seven-hour drive from Thornton, uh, which is just north of Denver, not far from the airport. So if those of you traveling in, whether you're flying, whether you're driving, uh, we hope to see you there at the 2019 Colorado State Championships at the Doubletree Hotel Thornton in the greater Denver area. And that's November 8th through 10th. Uh, what's that? About five weeks. Well, five weeks from now. All right, we're going to have a few more guests for you, but we, we did talk a little bit earlier about a trivia contest, so here we go. Now, if you think you know the answer, please send me a Facebook message. And I will uh, hopefully have a look at it. All right, send a, a message to Jim Stevens, the Jim Stevens Facebook message. If you know the answer to this question and you can win a, a set of Worlds downloads, and if you already have the Tornado Worlds, then we'll come up with something else for you. But I need you to name the three table surface colors of tournament soccer tables, which, of course, uh, right here in Seattle is, was the home of, of tournament soccer. But name the three table surface colors of the TS tables during the Million Dollar Tour of the 1970s in order of usage. In other words, uh, what was the first and then the second and the third? First person to send me a Facebook message with the correct answer will win a set of Inside Foods videos. All right, we're starting to get some answers to our uh, trivia question. And, of course, that's for those of you that are, that are watching live. Now, if you're watching this on replay, uh, don't, don't bother. Uh, I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and get a, get a message from somebody. But so far, we have not seen the correct answer, and we'll continue to monitor. And, and of course, some of you are not eligible. All right, let's see here. All right. All right, we have a winner.
Hmm. All right, we do have a winner. Lewis Waterman, you are the winner of, uh, of a video set of your choice. Uh, I'm thinking, Lewis, you might already have the Tornado Worlds videos, but um, just uh, send me an email and we'll get back to you, and you with your choice of, of whatever other title you would like uh, if you don't have the Worlds. But just send me a, um, a Facebook message when you get a chance of what you would like to. Nice job. The answer, green, blue, and brown. Now, there actually was a fourth color, believe it or not. Um, once the tournament soccer tour and the tournament soccer table basically crashed and burned in 1981, uh, the company was bought, I believe, by, uh, I'm not sure who it was, but a separate individuals, and they still continued to make a table called the tournament soccer table, which looked very much like the others, with the rainbow and, and, and the, the typical uh, tournament soccer logo, but the surface was black. So I, I didn't throw that one in just because that wasn't really the real tournament soccer table, but there actually was a fourth one. But, Lewis Waterman, you're the winner of our first trivia contest. Nicely done. And uh, go ahead and send us a, uh, go ahead and send us a, a message, and we'll, uh, we'll get you a set out to you. All right, we're going to give you some uh, final numbers from that last open doubles match. As we're getting prepared for another one, they're going to give us one match after another here, which is really great. So let's go ahead and uh, pull up. All right, let's pull up those stats. All right, looking at the numbers from um, that last match. Cam Burroughs, Dylan Fong, boy, 6 of 26 passing the ball. That's not going to get it done for Cam Burroughs, and he would be the first one to tell you that. Did shoot it well, 10 of 19, 53%. They cleared, and most of that was Dylan Fong, of course, at 57%. Around 60% clearing is usually about the threshold that we talk about as being very good. 50% usually with passing and shooting the ball. Um, they were one for two, passing from the two rod. Teddy Sprouse, another strong performance. Sprouse and Harvey, 52% passing, 17 of 33. 50% shooting the ball, 11 of 22. And 59% clearing, and again, we said 60% is good. They were 17 of 29. You see the overall scoring in the match, 16 to 15, closer than what you would have thought uh, in a four-game match. And you can see as you go down the list there, the four goals from Sprouse and Harvey. I think they might have each had two in that one. And uh, the overall scoring, as we said, 16 to 15 in a match that was uh, won in four games in 20 minutes and 56 seconds.
All right, we've got some more open doubles action for you in the round of 16 as we again head down to table number one, nonstop foosball here at the 2019 Washington State Open. That's Justin Shaw in the forward position and the Hall of Famer that we talked to just a little while ago. That's Kenny Rivera at goal. On the left, that's Bob Barnett in the forward position. Jerry Hobbs manning the nets. Best three games out of five with the winner of this one advancing to the quarterfinals. Shaw will have the first scoring opportunity shooting against Hobbs. And he strokes that one home to make it 1-0. Four Northwestern players, Pacific Northwest players, battling it out on here on table number one. And we're even at one. It's the pass from Barnett, able to squeak through against Rivera. It was a real pleasure having Kenny Rivera up here to talk about the, the golden era of foosball back in the 70s, the Million Dollar Tour, and his success as a player in a Hall of Fame career. And then the fact that he took off 35 years basically stopped playing around 81, came back, um, I guess, around 2015, 2016. I mean, that's remarkable to be able to come back, and he, and he has played well. He, he remains a, a good player. And, you know, once you, once you get to a certain level mentally, once you understand the intricacies of any game, I suppose, I think it's something you always have. I think even though you come back and the physical skills maybe aren't there, the mental game still is, the understanding of the game, the the table management skills. And then you spend a little table time and maybe some of those old physical skills come back as well. But so much of foosball, so much of any sport, I suppose, is, is mental. And that block by Rivera then spins back in on him, or even at two. Best three games out of five. Here's Shaw. He flips it over and then hammers it down the middle. Nice play by Justin. Barnett struggles with the ball, then is able to just slam it in. And we're even at three. Three three here in game number one. Chance here for Barnett to give his team the lead. And what blocked by Rivera, it hops back the other way, and Bob again will pick it up on the five. And pass though, stolen away by Shaw. Justin trying to get just the perfect setup and then nails that far corner. That was kind of interesting, wasn't it? Flipped it over, kind of nudged it into position, and tapped and went to that far corner to give his team a 4 3 lead here in this first game. Stolen away by Barnett. Bob shooting against Kenny Rivera. Lost it and was actually able to almost angle that one on goal somehow. And the rebound comes back to Hobbs. Jerry. Rebound picked up by Rivera. Quick pass along that near side. Justin Shaw continuing to really take his time when he gets it on that three row and take too much time on many occasions. We saw a 17 second possession earlier and I wonder we talked about him flipping and nudging. Was well, 16 seconds. According to Clay Toomey. And if Clay Toomey says it, it's true. Take it to the bank, folks. 
Shaw hoping to take it to the back of the goal here. And we'll see how long he takes. Well, he's going to step away and call a timeout. Jim Stevens with you here at the 2019 Washington State Open in uh, Seattle at the Interurban Hotel. Kind of an interesting place here, uh, about two miles from SeaTac Airport here in uh, Seattle, Washington. Justin Shaw will put it back into play. Looking for a first game win, Shaw. Trying to come near side, and there is Hobbs posting up to make the block and take it away. Sends that one up the table. Rebound, stab back towards his goal. He just clears it, but it's picked up off that back wall. And sent in here, and it's one game to nothing. Second game underway. Shaw went with that quick left hook. Blocked away. Rivera had it. Lost it. Now Barnett will set it up. Looking to strike first here in game number two. Bob walks it. Tried to come near side. Blocked and taken away by Kenny Rivera. And taken right back by Barnett. That shot attempt. Back the other way where Hobbs is able to pick it up. We're going to open doubles action in the round of 16. Barnett again, Rivera there to make the block. Sent back the other way by Hobbs. Kind of a defensive play there by Jerry Hobbs, just trying to keep it out and sends it into the zone of Rivera, who knocks it off that inside wall and grabs the rebound off his back wall. No score here in game number two, one game to nothing lead for Justin Shaw and Ken Rivera. And again there, Clay Toomey says they took 16 seconds between games you know, to get the second one underway. And again, I'm a believer. Take the full minute and a half. Why wouldn't you? I suppose if you're rolling, you want to stay on the table. I guess that would be a, a good reason. But if you're not rolling, certainly, uh, if you've just lost the opening game, take the minute and a half every time. Ten times out of ten. And I gave you some first game numbers. And Shaw able to get his team on the board first here in game number two. Justin Shaw just two for seven, passing it 29% in game number one. Well, it's four for six, however, shooting it. Bob Barnett, two for 11 passing. So the passing percentages on both sides, not, not real great. And Barnett just one for four shooting it. Bob trying to get going, and he is able to find the back of the goal here to make it 1-1 here in game number two. Jerry Hobbs clearing it 44% in that first game. Kenny Rivera cleared it 100% in game number one. And it's 2-1. Passed along the wall, Barnett couldn't hold on to it. before that last score had missed on his last five. Oh, beautiful pass along the outside wall by Hobbs. Let's see if Bob can get on a roll. Is he setting up a push kick? Tries to dink it to that short side. And Kenny Rivera, who shot, saw his share of push kicks back in his Hall of Fame career, able to make the block. One thing we have de determined over the years is that not everybody knows how to block a push kick. It's, it's not always an easy thing to do. Of course, 
some of the old school players who have experience defending against it have a, a little better idea. But I, I'm sure there are many players these days, young players, who have never faced a full-time push kicker. Well, we found that out last night. As we played in the uh, DYP and uh, must have played eight or ten matches last night. And had a lot of fun playing. But feeling it today. <laughs> D1 lead here in the second game for Justin Shaw and Kenny Rivera. Bringing you primetime foosball from Seattle, Washington. And Barnett, that was a spin. Justin Shaw will put it into play. Shaw dancing with it. Try to go with that left hook, something he's very good at, but Barnett knows Justin's game very well. And able to make the block. Now Shaw determined to try to score with that five row. Is it blocked? Rebound grabbed by Rivera with a little slicing pass intercepted by Barnett, who bounces it through the lane to his three rod and quickly converts to make it 2 2. Shaw. Going to give his team the lead once again. And he does. Three two lead for Shaw and Rivera. Barnett. Able to fire this one home. So Bob Barnett, whose shooting percentage had been hovering around the 20% mark, is able to get this one through. And we're going to get a switch on the left side. That is Hobbs defending the five. Barnett is back there defensively as Shaw goes nicely through that high lane. He'll shoot against Bob Barnett. And it comes down the middle, then back to the far side. Again, the creativity of Justin Shaw creating a goal. It's three, rather 4-3. That's good stuff from Justin Shaw. All the more interesting when we watch it on that close-up shot of the three rod. Hobbs able to get it through to Barnett. Bob. Set it up. No, nope, he's going to go with a quick one blocked by Rivera. Big possession here for Bob Barnett. We'll set up the snake shot on the near side. Work it towards the middle and tried to come back to that near corner. Blocked by the Hall of Famer Rivera up into the air and off the table. You get the sense that Kenny Rivera is just happy to be here. He just loves to be at a tournament, loves to be around the people, loves to play the game that was so special to him. And again, we, we tried during our interview to, to kind of recreate for you. Oh, nice pass here by Rivera and a chance to take a two games to nothing lead here for Shaw. But to try to bring you an idea of what that was like back in the 70s. And we get a little taste of it at the World Cup and at the Tornado Worlds and in Hall of Fame Classic. And here's Shaw. Flipping, rocking, and hammering it home far side. It's two games to nothing. But it really was a special time, and you can tell when, when Kenny was talking about it and just his overall demeanor on the table when he's playing, just how much he appreciates every day of his life that he is part of the foosball family. And, and we all kind of have a responsibility as members of this community to, to, to move it forward, to pay it forward to help create new players. That's why what uh, John O'Brien and company are doing up in New York State and what we hope will spread around the country is so important. You know, kids love foosball, says it right there. Take it to school, become a volunteer, be a financial sponsor. Head over to Foosball Clubs USA and donate. Uh, donate your time, donate your money, if you would, just so we can send our sport forward, to pay our sport into the future. I think we all sort of have a responsibility to do so, and we certainly 
uh, we'll do all we can to uh, to help generate new players, create a new generation of Foosers and members of the Foosball family. All right, here we go. Fourth game underway. Bob Barnett, rather third game underway. Bob Barnett puts it into play and opens it up with that one to make it one nothing. All right, let's have a, a look at the numbers through two games. Bob Barnett picking it up in that uh, second game, passing 50%, 6 of 12. Shooting percentage still, though, just 3 of 13 in game number two. 24% overall shooting it for Bob Barnett. Justin Shaw on fire was 5 for 5 in that second game. It opens up game number three with a goal as well. Justin Shaw for the match shooting 82%, 9 of 11. Now 10 of 12 with that last one. Sensational numbers from Shaw. Kenny Rivera clearing at 40, about 40%. And he's one for four passing the ball. Another possession here for Justin. And that shot attempt blocked this time by Hobbs. A rebound comes to Barnett. Bob Barnett, 38% passing for the match. 28% shooting the ball. Hobbs has done a nice job clearing, 58%. A couple of passes as well. We have not seen a score from goal yet. Shaw for the first time in the match, missing two in a row. Rebound grab by Hobbs. 1-1 here in the third game. Two games to nothing lead for Justin Shaw and Kenny Rivera. Couldn't grab it. Shaw able to pick it up on the five. Sends that one on goal. You know, there are a lot of great left hooks around. Of course, Tony Spreiderman with a, with a great one. Robert Mares, when he is up at that forward position, has a really good one. A lot of players do. Justin Shaw's is a little different. And he is able to sneak that one through Hobbs to make it 2-1. Shaw kind of weaves. doesn't pound the ball as he does every other shot, it seems. But just sort of releases it. But really disguises it well. Now, this is a big possession for Barnett, and he strokes it home to that near side. It's 2-2. Two -two. Hope you're enjoying our live coverage. At, and there it is. We just talked about it. A quick one. He gets it out there so quickly. doesn't hammer it. Not a lot of wasted motion. Low backswing, but very successful. And they're back on top at 3-2. But for the first time ever, inside Foo's TV channel, we are bringing you live foosball. Of course, lots of recorded uh, matches as well. Head over there if you're not there. If you're watching at netfoos.tv, go, go at least sample it. Go have a look at uh, Inside Foos TV channel at YouTube where we are simultaneously streaming. But also have a look at the 60, 70, 80, whatever number of videos we have over there. Some classic ones. And we talked about it earlier. There's going to be a really good one released here in, oh, about 10 days. Scheduled release of... October 15th for the Clash of the Titans. Lafredo and Colignon versus Spredeman and Pampas. And it was a good one. I was there. And Shaw was there. It's match point. Strong performance from Justin Shaw and Kenny Rivera. You're in this open doubles match in the round of 16. That one blocked by Rivera. And the rebound spins back to Kenny. Again, looking to pass. Done a nice job of getting Shaw possessions. Justin quickly along that outside walk and closed the deal right here. Justin Shaw fires it home. In three straight games, Justin Shaw and Kenny Rivera defeat Bob Barnett and Jerry Hobbs to advance to the quarterfinals of open doubles. I'd like to remind everybody, head over to uh, ifptour.com. There are results. There's upcoming events. Everything you want to know about the uh, International Foosball Promotions Tour run by Miss Mary Moore. Mrs. Mary Moore. 
Of course, uh, Colorado State Championships coming up in five weeks. Louisiana State Championships in six weeks as we round out the 2019 season. And I would be remiss if I didn't also ask everybody to uh, head on over to, of course, InsideFoods.com. Become a season subscriber. Get every match we record during the season. Uh, for those of you who really are interested in foosball history, uh, check out our complete collection on Hard Drive. 26 years now of table soccer action. Everything we have recorded since... Uh, 1993 World Championships in Dallas. All for one uh, reasonable price. And uh, foosball fans around the world, uh, uh, already many of you, of course, enjoying the Inside Foods Complete Collection. But head over to InsideFoods.com and, uh, and check out the uh, Complete Collection and everything else we have over there. Season subscriptions, individual videos, of course, including the recent Tornado World Championships. But help support us as well, Inside Foods Productions. Uh, we would love to continue to do what we're doing. We, we love this job, but we could use uh, your support, if nothing else. And, uh, of course, you'll, uh, I think you'll enjoy what, uh, what you do purchase over there at InsideFoods.com. All right. We are almost two hours into our three-hour primetime event. We're going to hopefully get another match for you here on table number one. All right, I think we can uh, go with our second trivia question. So get ready, folks. And if you already won once, Lewis Waterman, um, you can only win once here today, so you can't win again. But here's a good one. And it, it isn't really uh, Pacific Northwest related, but it's, it is an interesting one. You know, Todd Lafredo, the great player, originally out of Denver, Colorado, now out of wherever he chooses to live, has won... Uh, 22 Open Doubles World Championships on the American Tour. He also added a couple more, I think three others internationally. Um, but he has won 22 Open Doubles World Championships, but only one Open Singles World Championship. What year did Todd Lafredo win his one and only, if you can believe that, Open Singles World Championship? And again, Facebook... Jim Stevens, Messenger, and the first correct answer wins a set of videos. Or whatever that we, I, we'll, we'll say Tornado World Championships, but it's whatever. Uh, if you already have that one, uh, certainly you can get something else. And we're going to also check out the overall statistics from that last match as we wait for answers. The first one to get through with the correct answer, what year did Todd Lafredo win his one and only singles championship? We'll win a, a set of videos. All right, let's look at the numbers from that last one. Justin Shaw, seven of 17 passing, 47%. Look at that shooting percentage, though. 12 of 17, 77%. Kenny Rivera cleared it 37% and was one for five passing the ball. But Kenny did a nice job of feeding his partner for, for the most part during that match. Bob Barnett passing 12 of 30. Uh, that's 40%, just 6 of 21 shooting the ball. That's just 29%. Jerry Hobbs cleared at 8 of 14. That's 57%. 15 to 8, the overall scoring. Strong performance from Shaw and Rivera in a match that they won in three straight games uh, in 19 minutes and 2 seconds. 
All right, the answers are coming in. So far, not a correct one. I'm thinking there's a lot of guessing going on here. As we get ready for another match here on table number one momentarily. All right, we are waiting on our uh, next two teams. We're going to have a quarterfinal match in open doubles coming up. All right, the guesses keep coming in. And shout out to those of you watching, Harold Stalvey, of course, and Bud Sargent. Nice to hear from you guys. Oh, guess what? We have got a correct answer. The aforementioned Mr. Bud Sargent out of the state of Colorado. Eagle County, Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, up in the mountains uh, is correct. 1984. Nineteen eighty four, Todd Alfredo won his one and only open singles world championship. And this is a man who won twelve he won fifteen total world championships with partner Frederick Colignon. And he won with several other players throughout the years, Gus Trevino being one, Scotty Weidman they were the first team to go back to back in ninety four and ninety five. But just the one, the all time greatest American player who has put together an amazing resume over the years, but just the one, 1984 George Orwellian uh, win for uh, Todd Lafredo. There you go. Um, back when 1984 was the future. Now that's 35 years ago. But the one and only world championship came for uh, for Todd Lafredo in that year. Now, now Bud, who is a seasoned subscriber and has uh, pretty much everything, I think, for the last three years, will ha probably have to go into the archives and, and choose something earlier than that. So, Bud... Uh, go through, go over to our complete collection page at InsideFoods.com and go ahead and pick out a video of your choice that we will, uh, uh, of course, it's going to be pre-2015 oh, or so. But go ahead and pick one out and we'll, uh, we'll reward you to that uh, as well. And all, uh, all the information I get, and shout out to Kurt Davis watching, uh, nice to hear from you. But all the information I have is from uh, Kathy Brainerd's Who's Who of Foosball. Now, I have to admit, a lot of it I do already kind of know, um, just because I do this. But um, I did have to double-check and look back and see that uh, the Lafredo won in, in 1984. And it is listed in Kathy Brainerd's Who's Who of Foosball, which is sort of the, uh, the history book. And as you can see, we've got four players coming to the table, and we're about to get another open doubles match for you here on table number one. And let's head over to table number one again. We are still waiting for our fourth player to show up. And we're going to get another chance, our third chance, to, uh, to see Teddy Sprouse when he does eventually come to the table. Well, this should be a good one coming up here. Again, we, uh, we invite you... Uh, to send us your questions, comments, anything else, anything else you'd like to ask of me. And another reminder, we're going to do this a lot, folks, get used to it, that we want the kids to play foosball. It's as simple as that. And what John O'Brien is doing uh, with Foosball Clubs USA is so important. And please, uh, head over to Foosball Clubs USA, donate your time, donate your money, become part of this very important program. That, uh, that Mr. O'Brien is uh, doing his best to execute now nationally. It, Foosball Clubs USA is, uh, is a strictly nonprofit organization that is doing very important work spreading foosball 
uh, to a new generation of player, and, and that's really what we need. We need to create players. We need to uh, to create a system that uh, allows young players to get involved with this great sport, to become part of something. Uh, if you can't play football, baseball, basketball, you can certainly play foosball. There are no restrictions as far as size, sex, or anything else. And the kids need our help, both physically and financially. Maybe, maybe you can't volunteer at a local school or a youth center, but maybe you can be part of this work by becoming a financial sponsor. Show your, show your support by going to foosballclubsusa.com and make a donation today to this very important program. I, Brad Lorene's sitting next to me, and he's not on, on the microphone, but did you ever watch the Jerry Lewis telethons? I think it was Labor Day, and he would stand there for 24 straight hours on camera, uh, imploring people to, to donate or to become, you know, for mu muscular dystrophy, I think it was. Uh, I'm not quite to that point. We're only a couple hours in, but I, I'm beginning to relate to, to Jerry Lewis, uh, you know, a, a little more um, <laughs> as, we, as we do this without, without a break. Could I do it for 24 hours? I, I, maybe. It depends on how important it was. And, uh, but who knows? And I want to personally thank Mr. Lorene, who has been uh, a great help to, to us uh, with, with some of the new projects we're undertaking. As we move forward, hopefully, into the, uh, into the next few years of uh, Inside Foos, Inside Foos TV, netfoos.tv, and all the various platforms that we have to, to spread the word of foosball around the world. All right, we've got open doubles action. And for those of you out there watching, if you have any interest in becoming an Inside Food sponsor, uh, you know, send us an email. We'll kind of let you know what uh, what we're looking for and. Uh, Things are changing, folks. Uh, the whole uh, nature of recorded video, live video, is, is different. Of course, there's so much free content out there online. A lot of very good content. We like to think that ours is some of the best. And uh, if you want to jump on board with us and, and ride into the future, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'd love to have you a part of, of what we're doing. All right. Open doubles quarterfinal. That's Robert Hayes in the forward position, the talented player out of Oregon, his partner, Ricky Nagel. On the right, the red-hot Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey, the winner of this one, would advance to the semifinals in the winner's bracket of open doubles as we are getting this first game underway. Best three games out of five. We've had Teddy Sprouse on table number one twice during our uh, primetime event here at the Inside Foos TV channel, and he has been spectacular in both of those matches playing with great confidence, and he is such a good offensive player. So good on the five, so good on the three. Trying to whip that one out from the far side. Knocked down by Nagel. Robert Hayes, though, one of the most consistent, one of the truly outstanding players in the Pacific Northwest. We've had a chance to watch Robert several times, in particular at last year's Moneyball event, or earlier this year. Colorado State Championships, where he's had a couple of nice runs. Bardo Hearn celebration, uh, playing with our good friend uh, Brad Lorene earlier this year as well. He played very well. No score here in the first game. Jim Stevens with you. As we are now two hours and ten minutes into our primetime live event. And, and this is something I think we're going to be doing at every event upcoming, including Colorado State Championships. To kind of a concentrated three hours of continuous matches, which I know all of you appreciate. And the interviews, and we've had some nice interviews. Kenny Rivera in particular was really good tonight. Really interesting to hear his insights as Nagel able to find the back of the goal from the goalie position. One nothing lead early on here for Hayes and Nagel. Congratulations to our trivia contest winners. Lewis Waterman of Illinois. Bud Sargent of Colorado. Beautiful pass there by Nagel, but Hayes couldn't hold on to it. It comes back to Sprouse. Teddy has that one stolen away by Hayes.
Robert tried to take it out to the far side. Harvey with a block. Not real familiar with Ricky Nagel, although what we've seen so far has been good. A shot and a pass, which was dropped by Hayes, but still the pass was nice, and they're now up 2-0. But Robert Hayes, a dynamic offensive player. Teddy Sprouse, the same. And Ryan Harvey on the left side. Maybe the most talented player on the table. But a guy who, in this case, is playing the goalie position, and the occasional forward position. There you see Mr. Harvey. Oh, look at that. Beautiful pass along that near wall. Hayes. Try to come back down the middle, and that's, that's a good pick, even though it was blocked, but Robert, who is so quick to the corners, especially the far corner, he's really good at that far side snake shot, but to, to go down the middle here means that Ryan Harvey's going to have to look for that for the rest of the match. And that's going to open up those corners, you would think, for Robert Hayes. And this quick one here from Teddy Sprouse makes it 2-1. Hayes again. Try to take it out to the far side. Might have rushed that one a little bit. Blocked and taken away by Harvey. Shout out to uh, Danny Bennett watching in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. 2-2 here in game number one. Nice to hear from you, Dan. Recently moved to Cleveland, if I'm not mistaken. We talked a little bit about that the last time we saw each other. Thanks for chiming in. Here's Hayes taking some time. Again, out to that far side. Harvey, familiar with Robert Hayes, showed him that hole, then took it away, then brushes it into the goal to make it 3 2. Three two lead early on for Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey. Here's Hayes. The near side blocked by Harvey. Ryan Harvey doing a great job on both sides of the ball. Blocking Hayes well. He scored on that last possession. We're going to get a timeout. If you haven't already uh, and you're watching it uh, inside Foos TV on YouTube, uh, drop down over to that lower right corner of the screen. You might see a picture of me with a microphone. Click on that. Become a, become a subscriber. Become a member of the Inside Foos TV channel. Shout out to Greg Rushing. And uh, again, Greg, thanks for the, the order of the World Championship videos as well. We're going to send that link out to you as soon as we get a chance. We're, we're a little busy around here. But, um, all right, so we've got a, a, a brief break here. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. We're getting official. All right, they're gonna they're gonna change the rod here. It looks like so we're gonna we're gonna send you over to table number two for a little bit, and you can watch what's going on over there as we quickly get this rod changed.
And we apologize for that, folks. The audio uh, now back. Here on table number one, and we're going to get a call, uh, timeout here, called by Harvey, who will bring Sprouse back into the forward position. 2 nothing lead for Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey. And stroking in home here is Hayes. Apologize for that. Uh, oh, boy, it must have been almost 10 minutes now without sound of, of my voice. 3 1 lead now for Harvey and Sprouse. Boy, this is going to be a tough team to derail. About 8 30 here in uh, Seattle, Washington. Scheduled to go till midnight. I think we'll certainly uh, at least get to that point with our Inside Foods TV primetime event. And again, head over to Inside Foods TV at the YouTube channel and subscribe. Every time we put up a new video, every time we go live, you'll be notified. Shot on goal here by Nagel. Picked up by Sprouse. Games to nothing lead for Harvey and Sprouse. And again, Ryan will grab it. He'll call timeout. He'll bring Teddy Sprouse back into the forward position. Well, that's too bad. You guys missed some really good stuff. I, I was brilliant uh, during that uh, microphone outage. You'll have to take my word for it. Here's Teddy Sprouse, who is... Shooting 57% so far, and that percentage is going to go up, and it's match point for Harvey and Sprouse. Hayes picked up here by Sprouse. What a great performance again. Teddy Sprouse has really been the star of the show here for this uh, special event. Three matches we've done, three matches he has played really well. As has his partner, Ryan Harvey. Sprouse wants to score here. Hayes. And Sprouse back there defending. Robert again. Does find that far side of the goal to make it 4-2. Back to forward comes Teddy. He couldn't wait to get up there. And with just extraordinary confidence right now. Kept out nicely by Nagel. Hayes digs it out with the five. And stolen away by Sprouse. Who can win the match right here? Teddy Sprouse shooting against Ricky Nagel. And Nagel with a block back the other way. And it's going to spin back to Hayes who can cut the lead to one. Blocked by Harvey and taken away by Ryan. Sends that one up the table, grabbed by Nagel. Ricky has scored twice back here. Another chance, though, for Sprouse. They're going to send his team to the semifinals in the winner's bracket, and he does in three impressive games. Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey to beat Robert Hayes and Ricky Nagel to advance in the winner's bracket of open doubles. All right, while we uh, wait for another match here on table number one, let's head over to table number two. 
And we'll bring you the, uh, the final stats uh, for that match as well. But over on table number two. Bob Barnett and Jerry Hobbs, who we saw earlier on table one. They're on the left. John DeRoyne and Nick Lugie on the right side. This is a open doubles losers bracket match for 13th. First game with uh, Nick and John leading 3-1. Let's have a quick look at the, the stats of that last match. And again, it's going to be, uh, well, that's not uh, the correct one. <laughs> All right. Let's get the correct stats up there for you folks. That is the correct stats. There we go. All right. Teddy Sprouse, Ryan Harvey. You look at the uh, passing and shooting percentages, both extremely good. 53% passing, 59% shooting the ball for Sprouse and Harvey. And most of that was Teddy Sprouse at forward, of course, with those passing and shooting numbers. Clearing the ball, most of this is Ryan Harvey, although Sprouse spent some time back there. 64% clearing, one for two passing the ball. Robert Hayes, just a 9 of 26 passing and just 6 of 17 shooting the ball. Really ran into a... Some great defense from Ryan Harvey in particular. Uh, Ricky Nagel played a good match. Cleared it to 50%. Pitched in with a couple of goals and a, a pass as well. But it was Sprouse and Harvey outscoring Hayes and Nagel 15-8 to eight in a match that was 25 minutes and one second in length.
All right, folks, one more match coming up here in our uh, primetime event. We're going to head back over uh, as we leave table number two and head back over to table number one here momentarily for some open doubles action. We're going to be in the quarterfinals of open doubles, and it should be a good one. We've got uh, three Jeffs and a Cody. It's going to be Byrie and Pipkin versus Molnar and Lee coming up here on table number one momentarily. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us at both netfoos.tv and uh, Inside Foos TV at uh, YouTube. Hope you've enjoyed our three-hour primetime event. I hope you understand, though, after this match, which probably will take us over that three-hour uh, point, um, we're going to take a short break before we return and bring you some more play-by-play -play action to close out the evening. Uh, about 20 minutes, about 17 minutes now till uh, 9 o'clock Pacific time. And, of course, immediately following our uh, Inside Foods TV primetime event at YouTube, we'll be back over at netfoods.tv for the rest of the weekend of uh, about three more hours or so tonight and then all day tomorrow until the conclusion of the event. And we'll run this one tonight till about midnight over at netfoods.tv. But first, we're uh, going to bring you some more action here on table number one. Meanwhile, we'll take you over to table two and check in there where Bob Barnett and Jerry Hobbs are, looks like they're trailing one game to nothing, leading one nothing in the second to Nick Lugy and John DeRoyan. All right, folks, looks like we're about to get ready to go over on table number two. And yeah, we mentioned earlier, if anyone was interested in becoming an Inside Foos sponsor, whether you have a, a product, foosball-related or not, whether you'd like to hire us to come cover your tournament, whether you would uh, like to just talk about your tournament and promote it uh, through our platform of about 14,000 contacts, about 7,000 almost now of uh, YouTube subscribers and just contact us if you're very interested in, uh, in becoming a part of uh, the whole Inside Foos family. And uh, in terms of promoting your product, promoting your events, promoting the sport in general, uh, let us know. As we move into the future with uh, uh, Inside Foos TV and NetFoos.tv and, of course, Inside Foos Productions and the products that we produce, which, based on our feedback, I think most of you uh, appreciate 13 minutes out from our uh, deadline of uh, three hours, but we're going to exceed that tonight. We're going to move past uh, that 9 o'clock point with this match, of course.
All right, looks like we're about to get underway in open doubles here, a winner's bracket match in the quarterfinals. And uh, don't forget, folks, upcoming in about five weeks, the uh, Colorado State Championships in Thornton, Colorado, at the Doubletree Hotel, November 8th through 10th. One week later, down in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana State Championships, always a good one, November 14th through 17th. And then, of course, the, the new season kicks off in 2020, which that's really the future, isn't it? Uh, the IFP Tour kickoff. All right, we are ready to go here on table number one, open doubles, quarterfinal. That's Jeff Molnar in the forward position. Jeff Allen at goal. Rather, Jeff Lee at goal, sorry. Jeff Lee at goal, Jeff Molnar at forward. Jeff Pipkin in the forward position. Three Jeffs and a Cody. That's Cody Byrie back there at goal. I'm trying to think if I've ever had a match with three Jeffs before. I would say no. off the back wall here by Jeff Pipkin Jr. Who I believe lives up here in the uh, in the Pacific Northwest now, the Portland area. But formerly, of course, out of uh, Bozeman, Montana. And one of uh, Jeff's influences was uh, none other than Mr. Tony Spreadman, who spent a lot of time with the Pipkin family there at their at the homestead in, in Bozeman. And there's Molnar stroking it home to the near side. Jeff Molnar out of Southern Oregon. Medford, Oregon. Uh, Brad Lorene joining us again. Nice to have you again, Brad. Well, thank you, Jim. Good to see you guys up here. This is uh, going to be a good little match, actually. Although uh, Cody and Jeff certainly would be the uh, team to beat on this table. But Jeff Molnar coming out of Southern Oregon, he's actually got a good shot and a great five bar. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff can be really good at, at times. Consistency sometimes is the issue, but when he's good, he's very good. Yeah, he's going to give these two guys a battle. Uh, Cody is not the goalie uh, that uh, Jeff Pitkin normally plays with, which is, and would have been four Jeffs on this table, would have been Jeff Allen. That's true, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, I think Jeff, and four, Jeff. four Jeffs would have at least tied an all-time record. <laughs> maybe a tie, yeah, <laughs> just maybe a tie. And that went up the table off a couple of minutes in. It's 2-1 here early on. Two one lead early on for Pipkin Jr. and Byrie. Cody, a good goalie back there, good shooter. Smart defensive player. Very meticulous player, and that oftentimes uh, pays dividends as a, as a goalie. As he does all the little things, really focuses on doing all the little things. Jeff Lee will put it back into play. Cody is coming off an injury. Uh, he didn't play for about six months, I think it was. And then he, this is his first time back in a really heavier competition since his injury to his uh, right arm. He's wearing a brace, if you noticed. Or even at two, as that one went up the table and dropped in. I do see that, yeah. And we have not seen Cody. He was not at the Tornado World Championships. We haven't seen him in, uh, I, I guess you're right, several months. And here he is playing goalie for uh, Jeff Pipkin Jr. Cody likes to set it up here. He'll look at that inside bank. Now switching up, didn't like what he saw. Tried to pass near side off Pipkin's man. And Jeff Pipkin Jr. able to pick it up on the five. You know, Brad, I, I know you're a guy that's interested in technology, interested in social media, interested in how we can further promote the sport of table soccer. And yes. I'd love to hear your views on, on what you think of, of the future of foosball because th things are changing quickly when it comes to what we're doing and what the sport is doing as far as software and as far as uh, technological advancements. And it, I don't know, 
Well, the graphics and the things that we've talked about for software program that would be enhancing your product out there, we're going to be able to uh, bring that to fruition if we once get some of our sponsors involved and looking forward to having more people that think that we have a vehicle that will carry the uh, foosball and your product right out there to all of those players that you have and fans. You have an outstanding fan group. Lots and lots of people out there that really do enjoy what you do, Jim. You do a great job with it. So thank you, Brad. You say, uh, you know, the software and engineering side of this thing, it's it's just a little bit more we need, and we uh, we're going to have a great product here in the future with all the platforms that are available out there and uh, the sponsor ability. You know, with four million minutes of views you have had in 2019. Four That's million. Four million. Four million minutes. People have been watching you on YouTube only. Wow, uh, that's impressive. Even <laughs> I, I didn't realize the number was that high. It's yeah. Four two lead here for Jeff Pukin Jr. and Cody Byrie as Jeff Molnar able to pass this one through. But things are changing, and I think more than ever before, the Inside Foods product and NetFoods.tv and all the various platforms, Facebook, et cetera, Facebook Live, some of the things you and I have been yes, doing. Yes. Uh, more than ever, we can actually reach some pretty decent numbers. I, I feel confident that approaching sponsors now is, is more of a reality than it, it really ever has been. Without any doubt, it's, it's, it's the only way that we're going to have the chance and opportunity to go. Two lead here. Oh, good block. Another solid block out of Jeff Lee. He is he is putting up a stone wall here. See if Jeff can't uh, progress to the three bar and does not loses it. So those millions of, uh, of minutes watch is that is that from our, the back office at uh, at YouTube on, yes, on the inside of the show? Yeah. Yeah. It was on there with um, almost a million views. You got eight hundred eighty thousand views over just the two thousand and nineteen year alone. So right. we're you're going to be going over. 1 million views alone just on YouTube. That's not including all the netfoos.tv and other platforms that you've been involved with here later in the year. It's been a fantastic uh, uh, show that you've been able to put together, Jim. Uh -huh. Seriously, it's, it's been awesome. Thank you. I'm going to pay closer attention to those sorts of things moving into the future. I mean, we spend a lot of time, obviously, creatively in uh, developing what we do on air. and. Um, but, you know, again, the world is changing so quickly and yes. all the opportunities we have to, to spread the word of foosball. Well, and there's a lot of people out there, too, that really know a lot more than you and I know about this stuff. And we could use some help at some point. Love to talk to some people about how can we make a better product for foosball and gym and inside foos. All right. And Pipkin oh, finally fires it home. It's one game to nothing. Can. Right, Jim Stevens, Brad Lorene, Inside Foods Productions coverage of the 2019 Washington State Open from the Interurban Hotel here in uh, Seattle, Washington. George Barta doing such a great job with this event, and so far it's Jeff Pipkin and Cody Byrie doing a great job here on table number one. One game to nothing lead for Pipkin Jr. and Cody Byrie. And there's Jeff Lee with a shot up into the air and off the table. Uh, Jeff Lee, where's, where does he live? Jeff Lee is in Portland, Oregon. He's a Port Portlandier. Port no, what we, what Portlander. Do we, what do we call him? Uh, yeah, from Portlander. Portland. Yeah. Portlander. Yeah, right, he, we actually towards the Gresham area, okay. which is the east side of uh, Portland. And Portland, uh, a couple hours south of, of Seattle, the other side of the Columbia River. A 
One game to nothing lead for Jeff Pipkin Jr. and Cody Byrie. Another team certainly capable of, of winning this Open Doubles Championship. We've had a chance to watch um, so far Ryan Harvey and Teddy Sprouse play Open Doubles here uh, the last couple of matches, and they have been spectacular. That is a team that perhaps is going to win here this weekend. If they continue to play the way they are, I think Teddy Sprouse and Ryan Harvey win this championship. But uh, Teddy's got a great game. He's got a, a solid game. And Ryan Harvey is just one of the most talented people in the room when it comes to foosball. And just just as long as he keeps his focus on what he needs to be doing, and he they are a really, really tough team. And Molnar takes his time and strokes it home. It's one nothing. Picked up here by Pipkin. I remember the first time we ever saw Jeffrey Pipkin and his younger brother Alex. Alex was standing on a uh, on a bench. He couldn't have been more than about three feet tall, and he was playing adult style foosball with snake shots and great five row passes. And of course, these days we we know Sam to John out of out of New York. Oh, beautiful outside bank here by Cody. Something he does very well. It's one one. Now, does Alex play anymore? I haven't seen Saw him in Alex a long time. once in about the last 10 years, and it looks nothing like he did then. He's, yeah, uh, he's, he's, he's probably he, five feet tall now. He's a man. He, he is, he's probably six feet tall even. <laughs> yeah, well, but does Jeff. not does not play uh, a lot of foosball anymore. No, uh, he is uh, doing other things. And Jeff Pipkin Jr. has continued to play. And every once in a while, we see uh, Jeffrey's dad, Jeff. Another uh, Jeff. It's another a, Jeff. It's an yeah. echo in this room. And, and Mother Nora. Uh, yes. And actually, Jeff Pipkin and I grew up in the same part of the country at the same time, within about a two mile, about two miles away from each other. We we grew up in Inglewood, California. Uh, simultaneously, we lived there at the, at the same time, just a couple of miles away from each other, and didn't huh. know each other. No, we didn't. Now you guys have similar age. We are. Yeah. He Is looks that, his. <laughs> Was that about forty? <laughs> 40-ish. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, the, the profile there of Elwood Foos. Well, Cody and Jeff are the number one seed in this tournament. Right, understandably so. And I think Harvey and possibly, is it, I think Ryan, Ryan Harvey. Would be uh, the second seeds perhaps, yeah. Pro probably. Yeah. And they should be meeting in the finals, supposedly. Yeah, if things hold to form. Right now it's 1-1. Ball put back into play uh, by Jeff Molnar. Jeff swings and misses there, and then hammered the rebound towards the goal. Molnar and Lee are going to win this match. They're going to need some really strong work out of Jeff Molnar. Yeah, Jeff is uh, looking a little tight. And Cody comes back with another bank on that far wall, sneaks it in. Looking at the numbers so far here in this one. Some stats from our friend, Mr. Toomey. Jeff Molnar, four for 10 uh, passing. Two for four shooting the ball. Only four shot attempts so far. And I guess maybe that last one was a fifth through a game and three balls for Jeff Molnar. Jeff Pipkin Jr., three for 12, 25%. So Jeff Lee's done a nice job of keeping him out of the goal. But Cody Byrie has scored a couple. One in each game so far from his two rod. Cleared it at 64%. Lee just 29% clearing. That one does clear the zone where it's picked up by Jeff Molnar. Fires it home. That's what Molnar's going to need to do. Gonna need to get possessions, need to execute good quality shots on goal, and in that case, in goal. And we're even at two here in the second game. Three hours in now, folks. Three hours and two minutes into our uh, prime time event here at uh, Inside Foods TV. Hope you've enjoyed the show. After this match, well, we're going to take a short break from commentary, but we'll be back with you after a little while. But uh, certainly a badly needed break. You're not going to have one of those micro brews, are you now, Jim? Oh, not while I'm working, Brad. Oh, good call. Mm -hmm. Good call. You are a professional. <laughs> 
I'll drink to that. Okay. <laughs> Jim and Brad having some fun up here, and uh, no microbrewers to be seen anywhere. None. So far, Jeff Lee has had some difficulty clearing the zone, but he's also turned the ball over six times to uh, Jeff Pipkin Jr.'s three run. He wow. was able to make the block and take it away here. Well, he's, he's been blocking like crazy. He's had to. He's had to. He's lost the ball so many yeah, times. Pipkin has had uh, 13 possessions. Wow. Well, let's update those stats. And uh, now with the 15 possessions compared to a six for Molnar. Yet they have both scored three goals. And that is why, basically, Jeff Lee, despite the turnovers, is defensively keeping his team in the ballgame. And again, firing. Cody coming out of the back. Is that three? The bank. Is that that's all three. three? That's all three. There's Pipkin, a little wry smile. It's nice to see the goalie actually holding up the um, scoring here for mm -hmm. his partner, who normally is going to be a scoring machine. Jeff Pipkin is nobody's... God, he's a fantastic forward. Oh. And there is Lee producing from goal. Goalie wars. And Jeff Lee feeling good about that one, and well, he should. We're even at three here in the second game. One game to nothing lead for Jeff Pipkin Jr. and Cody Byrie. Oh, and what a oh, save geez. there is what Pipkin. Spins it back to his three run. And there is Lee again doing a really good job defensively. Had a chance to D. had a chance to play Jeff Lee last night in the uh, in the DYP. And he, of course, could not block that just absolutely blazing push kick. Uh, no, he blocked one. He blocked one. He blocked one. How could that happen? Here's Molnar. Every possession so vital for Jeff. But there's Byrie to make the block and take it away. Will he make it four? The all-time record for most goals in a game from the two rod is five, held by thousands, I think, at this stage. But but actually, in, in a game to seven or in a fifth game situation, overtime, that, that ah, record could be exceeded. It could be. It could go over. Ryan Moore, I think, uh, wants that record. If you're watching, Ryan, love to see it. Isn't he in Europe still? I don't know. Is he? I, I All of those beautiful pictures that he's been sending from Rome. In uh, right. Italy, it's just been fantastic. With his, with his lovely wife, Iveta, yes. who is uh, European. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Slovakian, I believe. Molnar going to the left hook, and then passed along the outside wall by Pipkin. And Beautiful. A Beautiful. timeout called here. 3-3. Three, three. By Jeff. Good stuff, Jim. This is a nice way to close out a beautiful evening of foosball here in Seattle. So thank you again, Jim, yeah. for coming out and enjoying us here Always in the Pacific fun. Northwest. Always fun to come up here to the Pacific Northwest. I hadn't been up here in so long before coming to the Moneyball event in March, run by Don Caesar and Kopi Cam. And, of course, we're looking forward to that one at the end of February, early March, right in that, uh, in that window. But I've always liked this part of the country. It is, it is truly one of the, the best places in America. Oh, we've got the change of shooter up here. Jeff Lee definitely put the bricks on uh, Jeff Pimpkin, and Cody's coming up front. We see Lee looking confident. We see Byrie shaking his head like he knows what he's doing. They're ready. Yeah, in these situations, usually uh, Cody pretty effective. You can count on the fact he's going to take his time. He's going to execute something smart. And of course, he's going to wipe the table. We, we knew that. <laughs> we knew that, yes. Yeah. Cody's home table is spotless, I guarantee you. As he puts the ball back into play, he's going to set up a pull shot here. Secondary option here. Normally a snake shooter, but perhaps the uh, the arm injury precludes him from shooting the snake shot. He did try to go straight, and then Lee with a quick clearing effort, taken away by Byrie. Back to the pull shot here for Cody. And he strokes home the pull shot. It's 4-3. Wow. Beautiful Good. shot by Byrie. Good looking shot. If that's his secondary shot, you'd hate to see what his first looks like, right? 
Back comes Molnar. This is a big possession here for Jeff. And he strokes it home to make it 4-4. Yeah, they're switching back again. Byrie is going to step into the forward position with possession of the ball on the five. And he, he doesn't like having a wrap on the five row or he doesn't like the way that it was attached to the five row. And I think we're going to get a timeout called here. Probably a Jeff probably called that timeout. <laughs> I'm thinking what it was a Jeff. 75% chance, <laughs> chance of Jeff <laughs> making Jeff a call, call here. We're a little giddy, uh, a little punch drunk, perhaps. We've been live continuously now for almost three hours and ten minutes. Which you having is, fun, though? Come uh, on. We are having fun. I, I'm having a great time, Good. of course. Good. Well, we'll be seeing you in Colorado. We will, yeah. And that's uh, five weeks from now, Colorado State Championships. Yep. Hosted by the Chapmans and uh, Tim Walters and company. Hopefully we've got some Colorado boys and people that are watching our uh, telecast tonight. Yeah, we do. I know of at least one, Mr. Bud Sargent, who won one of our trivia contests early on. I did. He was up in the mountains, Good pass. as many of us do in Colorado. And Byrie able to pass it along the near wall, a chance to take a two games to nothing lead as he sets it up against Jeff Lee. Cody Byrie. Trying to come down the middle, blocked and taken away by Lee. Jeff sends that one wide. Pipkin with the rebound. Jeff, a pretty good shooter back here. And pull kick. Rebound grab by Lee. And the key here is for Jeff to clear the zone. Molnar had it briefly. Rebound grabbed by Pipkin. Jeff along the inside wall towards the goal. Kept out by Lee. Jeff has scored once. And now he scored yeah, twice. twice. It's one game. game apiece. Big play from Jeff Lee. We have ourselves a match. So you were saying earlier that uh, Kenny Rivera was quite the interview? Oh, he was great. Yeah, it was, it was, it's always great to talk to the guys who were there, you know, during mm -hmm. that uh, the golden era of table soccer in the 1970s to kind of, you can almost sense, uh, the, they, they almost get chills thinking back on that. And they think of how warmly uh, that era was for them. It was a you know, momentum, momentous for momentous, yeah. All of those players who competed back on that tour at that time as we get game number three underway. Back to forward comes Pickin, who fires in home to open up the scoring here in the third. We're even at one game apiece, one nothing lead now for Pipkin and Byrie. Well, this is three out of five in the winner's side still. But when you talk to the guys who were there, and, and I had a chance to actually see a little bit of it myself, but uh, it, it hasn't been quite like that since. And uh, you get a little taste of it when you go to the World Cup, uh, the professionalism, the the way it's marketed, uh, the way that the, the event itself, the feeling you get of being there, but... You know, the immensity of it, the crowd, the whole feeling of picking up. Oh, Jeff Lee stabs it out of there and makes that. Yeah, that's three in the match now for Lee. Who's played good defense and has scored a few. The, the passing, or rather the clearing percentage, still relatively low, and we'll get those numbers for you here. Jeff Lee now almost up to 50% clearing. Much better. He has scored three in, in the match so Another far. Good block. And uh, he has held Jeff Pipkin Jr. Uh, to just uh, about 23% shooting. That Buddy Byrie cool. shooting 33%. Uh, Jeff Lee doing a job. The clearing percentage could be a little higher, but other than that, uh, Lee has played very well with the scoring and with the defense. Look at the score again here as he sets it up on the near side. You know what? I'm thinking that uh, the Pippin needs to switch to a push kick. <laughs> yes, but it wouldn't ever be as blazing as yours. Here is Jeff walking it. Uh, loses it briefly. Resets it and strokes oh, it over. home. Darn it, Jeff. It's 2-1. 
you ever root for a team at all, you know, in your, in your head? Um, do you want me to give away trade secrets here? Or do you want me to, you're trying to accuse me of some sort of favoritism? Well, I would never nice accuse pick you up of here anything, by you know Pipkin. That. Um, only if my wife's playing. Yes, <laughs> Pipkin sets it up, strokes it home, it's 3-1. So Jeff Pipkin has turned it around offensively here in this third game. As he and his partner Cody Byrie now up 3-1. And we have a timeout. Um, you know, certainly I'm human. <laughs> Newsflash. But, you know, Barely. of course we have our, our favorite players. We have our, you know, we root for the underdogs at times. Uh, when I'm in Europe, when I'm covering a World Cup, am I rooting for Team USA? Oh, heavens yes. Heavens no. No, of course you wouldn't. What's one of the most exciting World Cups that you've ever been involved with? Well, the most exciting match, period, I've ever been involved with, and you were there. Uh, 2006, uh, World Cup in Hamburg. That Saturday night, the USA versus France. A match that was about four hours in length. I don't think I, I sat down. For, that's the only time I've gone longer than tonight, <laughs> is for that one. It was on the air for four hours. Phenomenal time over there. It was an amazing match. Amazing. Roller coaster ride, controversy, huge crowd. The crowd kept getting bigger. By the end of the evening, there was a thousand people in the rafters and in the bleachers watching that. The that fish match. market. It was a phenomenal setting in itself. It was just so historic and beautiful. Really cool place. But I think it was I think it was a foosball's finest moment. And Pipkin really heating up now as he fires that one home to make it four one. But I don't think there's ever been a, a greater match played in, in the history of table soccer than that one that night, the very first World Cup. It was still sort of raw and and, uh, and that night of amazing table soccer was really remarkable and that one inadvertently knocked in by Lee. It's two games to one in favor of Pipkin and Byrie. Even though the United States lost that particular match, it just was so phenomenal to feel the energy and seeing these guys that are normally competing against one another come together in the camaraderie yeah. that they had yeah. was so phenomenal to feel. I was so blessed to be able to be part of the sponsor that uh, Jim Waterman of foosball.com and myself, we helped sponsor the United States team to actually get there. Oh, yeah. And it was, oh, it was a beautiful time. It was great. It really was. It was something new and fresh and uh and still kind of untried. That one blocked here by Byrie as Molnar got a possession. Let's uh, check the numbers. Through uh, three games. Jeff Molnar, just five of 20 passing. He's only had eight shot attempts in three games. Eight? And his five row normally is really, really good. Did not have a shot attempt in, in that uh, in that third game, according to, to the statistics provided by Clay Toomey. Four for eight shooting the ball so far for Molnar. 50% is pretty good, but not yeah. when you only have eight shot attempts. On the other hand, the team of Pipkin and Byrie have had 24 shot attempts on their 3 row. That inside bank on goal by Lee. That was a good shot, yeah. Picked up here by Molnar on the five. Jeff, 6 of 21, 6 of 22, passing the ball. I guess 5 for 20, 25% through three games for Molnar. And he strokes this one home. So he's shooting it well. He just needs more opportunities. It's one nothing here in the fourth. Jeff Pipkin Jr., 7 of 21 through three games, shooting it just 33%, but 4 for 6 in that last game. He had to go 4 for 6 just to bring that shooting percentage up to 33%. Previous to that, he was 3 for 15, just 20%. Jeff Lee, so far in the match, has scored 3. Cody Byrie also with 3 from goal. I have a question from Dan Bennett watching in Cleveland asking about some of the, the names that were playing on that American team back in 2006. And the one that immediately comes to mind, because I think it's the only one he ever played in, was Terry Moore. Yep. And, I, and I remember a moment, uh, a huge play in, in the course of, of, of the match. And the intensity, I can't even describe how intense it all was. 
But Terry Moore literally jumped up in the air, and, and they were playing on kind of this platform, platform. if you record. Yeah, yeah. And when Terry jumped, jumped and Terry is a large man. <laughs> yes. A nice pass here Very to, nice. to Molnar. But yeah. Terry jumped a foot in the air. And Terry Moore, yeah. six foot five and 380 pounds. Uh, you felt it, yeah. even in the old it fish was. auctions hall. Yeah. Well, so, the exuberation of, of that particular match that Terry was involved with. Who was his partner? Do you remember? I'd have to I'd have to look it up. Look it up. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, Billy Pappas was on that team. No, was Billy on that team? Yeah. Uh, Tony Spreadman was not. Tony there. was not. Todd Lafredo was not. Todd Lafredo was not. So you had Dave Gummison, Gummison was there. Yeah, Adrian Zamora. Zamora. Yes. yes. Uh, and at that time, also. Iceman. Well, no, Iceman wasn't on the team. Though. No, 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 he was, he was there working with, with me. That's right. But also, in that at that time, they, the men and the women played together. Uh, That's so right. Lotus, yes. Leong, uh, Chesbro was there, Tiffany Moore. Did Kathy Brainer play? Kathy, on that team, she might have been a part of that team. I know she played I know the she senior. Was there. Events. She was yeah. there, yeah. yeah uh, Rob Mares. Of course, Mares has been a part of it, and Tom Yor, both yep. of whom have been a part of every United States uh, World Cup team. And now his uh, son might be getting involved at some point, you would think, right? Tom Yor's son? Yes. Probably yeah. could have made it this year, and uh, and certainly with the next one. I mean, he's the Tornado World Champion at Open Doubles. Well, Tom Jr. was there at just a little kid at that, yep. that event 13 years ago. Yep. And there is Pipkin continuing to shoot it well. Jeff, after a slow start, has really come alive down the stretch here. Bruce, Bruce uh, Nardochi was also on that team. I believe he was, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And Alan Cribbs was the coach. Yeah. And I was there with Brad Anderson and Ezekiel Iceman Moore, Christina Fuchs. Moreland was there, too. Brendan. Brendan Moreland was there. He, he refereed a lot. I don't think he was a member of the no, team. No, he wasn't, but he was there. Yeah. He was there, yeah. That shot attempt blocked up into the air and off the table by Byrie. It is two games to one in favor of Jeff Pippen Jr. and Cody Byrie. Or even at one here in the fourth game. Now, is there any way that anybody could go back to the archives of yours and see any any of those? Oh, yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, of course, you know, Brad, I have a, a hard drive now that has my complete collection on it. Everything I've done since the 1993 World Championships, it has that on it. It has all the and multi-table... Uh, World Championships has every Tornado World Championship except for 2011. And That's you're selling those online. Yeah, yeah. You can head over to InsideFoos.com, pick up the complete collection. Uh, there's several of them out there, and we get tremendous feedback from it. It is an amazing amount of foosball. It is uh, my life's work, and uh, and certainly uh, we'd appreciate it if you head on over and at least have a look at uh, what's on it. All the listings are there. Everything that Frederick Collignon ever did in the United States, a, a great part of Todd Lafredo's career, Terry Moore. Now, you're going to have a special uh, coming up real fast, uh, what, the next week, two weeks, with uh, a classic that you're going to come yep. out with? Yep, that's that's right, uh, an Inside Foods classic match from 2006, uh, the Clash of the Titans, we call it. Colignon and Lafredo versus Spreidemann and Pappas. How about that? Uh, Billy Pappas was there, absolutely was yeah, he there. was there. He was rooming with uh, Moreland, in fact. All right. That I did not know. Yeah. But yeah, in a couple of weeks, we'll, uh, we'll let everybody know when that one's going up. Uh, and, of course, if you have the complete collection, you already have that match. But we're going to put it up on, uh, on Inside Foods TV here in a couple of weeks. And uh, you could look at that. Colin Young, Lafredo, Pappas, Spreiderman. And you could say that's the four greatest players of all time. You could say that. And, of course, Tony recently went over to Germany and won the Landhart World Championship and Open Singles. Now, you just recently uh, did that match for, what was it, Kazoom? For Kazoom and Table Soccer TV, the ITSF-affiliated uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, they, they asked me to go ahead and commentate uh, that match, that World Championship final. And we did, and uh, boy, Tony played well. Going up against a, a really good young German player. Molnar needs a goal. Jim Stevens uh, joined our special guest, Brad Lorene. Go check out Brad's website as well, rodlock.com or rod-lock.com. Either of them work now, right? Yeah, I I just 
got the other one the other day, not too terribly long ago. Feel pretty good about it. Don't need the dash any longer. Yeah, it's always nice to have a little dash around. <laughs> Maybe a dash hound. Jeff Molnar still just 42% shooting it. Well, it's not bad. It's, the problem is he's only had 12 shot attempts. Yeah, he's struggling with the five rule. Jeff Dipkin Jr. has made six of his last 11 to increase his shooting percentage to 35%, although Lee, who has done a nice job defensively, is there to make the block here. Jeff Lee's clearing percentage up to 60%. 10 of 11 so far here in this game. Lee's had a good match. He has also scored three times and held Pipkin and Byrie to just uh, 10 of 29 shooting. Yeah, as a goalie, that is a fantastic uh, percentage to keep a, that type of a forward down. Let's see if Molnar can't get that. He is not. Of course, the 2009 uh, World Cup also a really good one, and that's part of the collection. And that was the very first win for Team USA. Where was that held at? That was in Nantes, France. Uh, the next one will. And, of, of course, the USA has won six of the ten World Cups. And six of the last nine have gone to Team USA. Who are the other teams that have won it, then? Well, that first one in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Hamburg, back in 2006, was won by Austria. And then in uh, uh, Frederick Collignon got one with Belgium. The French beat the USA in a, in a final. The only time the USA was not in a final besides 2006 was when uh, Belgium won, uh, the USA having lost to the Germany in the semifinals. And the other one, uh, Luxembourg in Italy a few years ago, 2015. The USA with six. Austria with one, Belgium with one, France, France, and the aforementioned Luxembourg. So six of the ten have gone to the USA. And uh, the, the women finally added a World Cup championship this year. First time that uh, Team USA had won the gold medal in uh, the women's team competition. A lot of young Great playing women have come up through the ranks here over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, Midori Kimura, who is back to back double world champion and right now the best lady player on Tornado, no question about it. Yeah, Jackie Han as tough. well. Yes. Sullivan tough, Rue. Tough yeah. That's one thing that the, the, the ladies are, are doing is they're, they're bringing the young players in, and there's Jeff Pipkin able to fire that one home to the near side. It's 3 1. As Jeff Lee takes a walk. Takes a drink and takes a step back to the table. Jeff working hard back there. And Molnar couldn't connect. Picked up here by Lee, who does have some very quick hands. And that one knocked in. It's match point. Winding down the uh, inside Foos TV. Prime time event. Our first time doing this. We're going to try to do it at every event. In fact, I think Friday night at Colorado State Championships, we're going to open things up with a, a special event like this. And yeah, uh, tell us how you guys like this. Is tell Jim if you like how this is working out for for him and and how easy it was for you, or if whatever Jim can do better. Uh, besides having me out of the booth, <laughs> <laughs> first thing that came to my mind. Yeah, well, it might be. <laughs> Mr. Molnar well, is not a happy camper. We are working hard to improve the product. We're hoping to upgrade some things, get some overlays for scoring, which is one thing we really want, and uh, be able to feed some some live footage into our streams and uh, a few other things that we, we would love to improve the product. And uh, Jeff Pipkin Jr. now with a chance to win the match as he sets it up against Jeff Lee. Trying to come back down the middle, blocked and taken away by the red-headed Lee. He's a Trailblazer fan. He is. He oh. follows those Trailblazers religiously. Well, they're good. Yeah, it's a good team. The yeah. NBA Western Conference is loaded, but that one blocked back into the goal, and there it is. So in four games, Jeff Pipkin Jr. and Cody Byrie defeat Jeff Molnar and Jeff Lee to advance in open doubles. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up, our Inside Foos event, primetime event here at... Uh, 
at YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to hit back over now. We're, we're done here at YouTube for tonight, the uh, Inside Foods TV channel. Please, if you haven't yet, uh, please uh, become a member. Subscribe to uh, Inside Foods TV, and you'll be updated every time we load up new uh, content, every time we go live. And um, we'd love to build that subscriber uh, base and uh, continue to bring you great table soccer at Inside Foods TV. And, of course, at NetFoods.TV, we we're going to head back over to now. So thanks for joining us for this first ever Inside Foods TV primetime event at YouTube. It's been a great deal of fun. Three and a half hours of solid content, great interviews, trivia contests, and everything else. Again, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you over at netfoods.tv. Mm -hmm.